story about a real-life con woman is so captivating to viewers. Plus, Bob Odenkirk on the ups and downs of his career in an exclusive conversation on his brand new memoir. And a clip from The Vault featuring Oscar winner Javier Bardem. But first, here's today's pop star. Lots to get to in pop star today. Savannah, is it Rami and Michelle's wedding? Or... <laughs> Rami. Rami. Well, I might butcher this one too. First up, Fantastic Beast, The Secrets of Dumbledore. Break out your wands, everybody. On Monday, Warner Brothers dropped a new trailer for the third chapter in the Harry Potter prequel series, the new preview teasing fans with a big return to Hogwarts as Jude Law steps back into the role of young Dumbledore and prepares to face off with one of the wizarding world's most infamous villains. I'm sorry to disturb you, Albus, but I've just received troubling news. Tell me, what is it? It's Grindelwald. The time is closed, my brothers and sisters. Our war with the Muckles begins today! The world as we know it is coming undone. If we're to defeat him, you'll have to trust me. All right, Fantastic Beast, this Beast, The Secrets of Dumbledore hits theaters April 15th. Oh, thank God that's done. Next up, <laughs> Dwayne Johnson, The Rock Never Fails to Tug at Our Heartstrings with this thoughtful post on social media and a new video. He's sharing a special moment from a visit to his grandparents' gravesite with his mom in Hawaii. I mean, Daddy, this is for you. And for all of you out there who's lost someone, this is for you. Oh, that's so nice of you, huh? Lee, my name is go for a walk. Tell it all, tell it means too much talk. I love for you to buy means I love you. Take it easy means fire and Johnson adding in the caption, life moves so fast, uh -huh. how important it is to just slow down, sit here, reminisce, and listen to her sing, play her ukulele, and tell all her stories. Some wise words from The Rock there. Sweet. Next up, Michael Douglas, the Oscar winning is Amy, winner, is aiming to catch lightning in a bottle with his next big role. Douglas set to star as Benjamin Franklin in a new oh. show that's headed to Apple TV+. Plus. The limited series is going to be set in the later years of Franklin's career, around the time he engineered America's alliance with France and peace with England. That'd be between 17 1978 and 1783, if my <laughs> memory right. recalls. Was well it Romy or Rami? It's weird Romy, the things you remember. <laughs> Douglas will also produce the project based on Stacey Schiff's book, A Great Improvisation, Franklin, France, and the Birth of America. No word yet on when that show's scheduled to premiere, but it does look good already. Mm -hmm. All right, finally, the first day of the month can only mean what? one thing. That's Jenna Bush Hager is here with a new book. Yes, <laughs> there I go. am. I'm so happy to be a correspondent on Pop Star. Let's do it. Are you all ready? Yes. yes. You have a countdown. Down, I think. Are we counting down on the plaza? I hope so. Three, if not, three, <laughs> three two, two, one. one. It is Groundskeeping by Lee Oh, thank Cole. God, it's that one. It is there a they beautiful, are. beautiful novel about an inspiring writer who takes classes at a local Woo! college and becomes the groundskeeper. He falls oh. madly in love with a girl named Alma, who is very different. It takes place in 2016, oh. but it's about family, unconditional love, and what binds us. Y'all, mm -hmm. in a time where everybody's so divided, yeah. we need this so book. Groundskeeping. Yeah. Okay. It. You can head to today.com yes. slash read with Jenna or use that QR code for more information. Join the book club. There's not only a book club, it's a whole conversation. Then you can buy the book or mm -hmm. be like me and wait till the movie comes out. <laughs> Do that, yeah. but you know what else you can do? You can what? join us tomorrow live on our plaza. We're going to celebrate the third anniversary. Three oh. years. I've turned three. Oh, of oh my gosh. With Jenna, I know also, because oh. there's 35 books I still got to read from the last three years of you read with Jenna. We have Nancy a lot. Reads more, yes, she does. and also reads it may be Nancy's favorite day. It's Read Across America Day. Yeah. So we're going to have a really oh, cool story. Oh, Way to go, Jenna. Way to go. And now the reason we call the show Pop Star Plus, a few more headlines for you, and we'll start with Euphoria. The Zendaya-led series is making its way into HBO history. Sunday's season two finale was the network's second most watched show since 2004. The grungy high school mega hit coming in second only to, that's right, the mega hit Game of Thrones. Of course, you can believe it. It's already been three years since Game of Thrones wrapped up that show's finale, and it scored a whopping 19.3 million viewers. A good sign for the upcoming spinoff, House of the Dragon, which is scheduled to premiere later this year. Finally, America's Got Talent Extreme in last night's episode of the AGT spinoff, a 90-year-old grandmother stunned judges when she came out to perform a fiery stunt with her 24-year-old grandson. Lillian held on tight to Hunter as the pair rode through, count them, five walls of fire. Well, there's...
there's the extreme part of AGT Extreme. No surprise, all three judges gave Lillian and Hunter a big yes. And that's going to do it for your Popstar Plus headlines. But we got a lot more coming up. Anna Klumski is going to give us a glimpse into her new miniseries that a lot of people are talking about. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Welcome back to Popstar Plus. You might know Anna Klumski from her Emmy-nominated role on Veep or the beloved 90s movie My Girl. Well, lately she's starring in Inventing Anna, a new miniseries about Anna Delvey, a real-life heiress who stole money from New York elites. Klumski plays a journalist investigating Delvey's story, and she told us what she hopes viewers take away from the show. I think Anna Delvey, I didn't know anything. And, uh, and it was really fun when I like told younger people, like my brother or something, that uh, you know I'm gonna do this show about this young woman who who conned a lot of people and then you know my brother's like <gasps> Anna Delby like he was like so excited and yeah so I uh I got to come to it this way I might have a story her name is Anna Delvey or Anna Sorokin no one's sure she's either a rich German heiress or she's flat broke the charges are insane You know, Shonda was interested in a lot more than just adapting a salacious, you know, kind of rich people story, right? Like she was interested in so much more about about how people treat each other, how people deal with each other. Who who's privy to whose information? You know, um, why? What are the sanctions for? Are the sanctions correct? Um, do they need to be adjusted? Um, you know, how how far can you get into somebody's life without harm being done? You know, think. All of these things. She is everything that is wrong with America right now. I am famous. I mean, I know why our telling of it captivates me, but I, it's it's honestly still a question I have of what about her actual story has has lasted this you know already like it's, it's got legs and people still care about it and I think that's wonderful obviously selfishly I think it's wonderful um but it is sort of surprising but yeah like we're living the actual phenomenon of her gripping personality you know she definitely does remind you of those of the types of people that that do kind of just grip on um on the people that they meet and they just make them want to please them. And so I think that society is doing that <laughs> in a weird way. And I'm part of it. Millions of dollars. Hi, Anna. I just had some questions. I have a question. What's you wearing? You look poor. It's something I really I, uh, connected to with playing Vivian was that she just really, really loves her craft. She loves the craft of journalism the way that I love the craft of acting. I mean, I think on the very surface, she and I both are really, really fast mental processing. You know, like we're, we've just got a ton of information and we're, and it's all, it's all game. 
so Jessica is um, is one of our co-producers. So she's she's given our blessing all the way um, from the get-go. And I, like we, you know, we, we didn't have like lunches. You know, we didn't do that sort of thing because I I actually was tasked with not matching. I'm not matching her. Some of our our cast members um, had that assignment to you know to be playing a real person that is is known and and um, and to match them. And, and mine, we were fictionalizing. Um, so we're very, very inspired, obviously. We're, the article's the article. But because the article is the thing that we were keeping most closely matched, that is sort of what I went with. I went with all of the written word that I could. I read all of Jessica's articles. I read all of her notes. Um, she's, she, she's a copious note taker, and I and thank you. <laughs> um, you know, especially as we were discussing for, discussing for such a cerebral um, character, it almost feels like the written word you're gonna you're you're gonna unlock a lot more through their voice um, uh, on the page, and um, and I just felt like it was that that was my way in. It, it was it was like a I don't know it was like a decoding um, the written word, and I loved that. It helped me with with all my choices. I think Anna Delby, you know, is up to her, and uh, yeah, I think I think she's. I think she's impossible to know. Um, I never met her personally, so I'm not going to really get into who she is, but you know, I, again, another question, how much can you ever know a person, right? Is your is the way you see green the way I see green? None of us are gonna know, like ever. <laughs> so yeah, um, and you know, it's, it's, it's for her to know and it's for other people to, um, to determine how much it matters to them. I hope that people, it's like the slow burn that I always hope for after a show, you know? I, I really hope that, you know, as they walk around in their own lives, making their own choices, they they have another platform upon which to, to decide, um, you know, what they think is good and bad, what they think is right and wrong, what is okay with them about the way people treat other people. You know, I feel like we present so many great and important and relevant questions about today's, we use the word society so much, but it's true, um, you know, about today's society that I think that, you know, an audience member would be remiss uh, to not adopt some of those questions themselves. You know, so that's, that's I just hope that they, they come, you know, come out of it with, with, with some, some personal debate. It's good. It's good. We should mention you can catch Inventing Anna right now, streaming on Netflix. Next up, a visit with the great Bob Odenkirk. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. NBC News, streaming free now. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free, now. 
And we're back on Popstar Plus. Bob Odenkirk is unmistakable for his roles, of course, in Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. Now in the new memoir, comedy, 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 drama, he put pen to paper about his own career in showbiz. And he told us all about it today in Studio 1A. and comedian Bob Odenkirk is one of Hollywood's most beloved stars. He's a four-time Emmy nominee for his starring role in Better Call Saul and shined on the beloved Breaking Bad, and now he's sharing his story. It's a new memoir. Comedy, 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 drama. Bob, good morning, good morning. How are hey, you? Hey, I'm good. I'm just, happy you so you're, I'm just happy you're here in this chair. That's so nice of you to say. We were talking I, about how you had, you call it a heart incident. Well, I want to just speak about it properly. Yeah. Heart doctors tell me that what I had was a heart incident, not technically a heart attack, but I don't know what the difference is. <laughs> I was turning blue and not breathing, and my, uh, my heart was arrhythmic and it needed to get back to a rhythm. Where I don't really understand how it works, but I just know that I wouldn't have survived. if. Where uh, did it happen and how? I was that? in the studio shooting Better Call Saul, our final season, yeah. which is gonna premiere on April 18th. Mm -hmm. And it's gonna be great if you're a Better Call Saul fan. Yeah. I can't wait for you to see this, but we were shooting a great scene, me and Ray Seahorn and Patrick Fabian and some other people. Yeah. And uh, we had gone off to our waiting area, yeah. and luckily I stayed in the area with the other actors, because if I'd gone to my trailer, I wouldn't be here right oh now. Oh, my God. So I went down, and they uh, set up the alarm, and, and people came out. And uh, Rosa Estrada, our health officer, was a, a medic who served in the armed forces for a tour, and she came out and started CPR on me and saved my life. Did some people have epiphanies after something like that? I'm having a very slow epiphany, yeah. even right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the epiphany it was simply that my life is pretty damn great. Oh, great. And I should yeah. appreciate it and the people around oh. me. Um, honestly, that's, you know, I think people do have epiphanies when they have a near-death experience. Um, and oftentimes it's, I have to change something, you know. And I think my epiphany is I have to appreciate what I have because hmm. it's really great and I've got great people around me and um, for some reason people are very <laughs> nice to me well, and, and were so nice on social media when I had this heart, well, heart attack. Well, Bob, um, this book is filled with all of that appreciation, but what you found I love is a lot of what you appreciate your life or maybe the things that didn't happen the way you mm -hmm. want them to. Yeah. You were talking about once where you were, you were, you were trying for that Steve Carell job at the office and you yeah. wrote, um, one trick to surviving Hollywood's beat down is to keep making new things in spite of every no. Yeah. To somehow stay in touch with the joy that brought you to the game. It can be hard to do when you're, there's me and Chris Farley backsta yeah. backstage in Second City. That's me and Robert Smigel, yeah. a great writer of sketches. And uh, my oh, my agent, Ari Emanuel, so, now a world beater, no. amazing guy. So how did and, you pick yourself up when there was a when there was a swing and a miss like that? You know, I always had a weird faith in this business that if you came to it with a fresh idea, that you you'd get a, a hearing, a chance. Mm. And it's really true. I mean, showbiz loves new faces and reinvented, you know, characters and faces. So I uh, I think it's just been a great business, and I just believed I, even in the hardest moments, the sense that I had something to offer if I just was patient and set to writing, which is how I started as a writer. Well, as a writer on SNL, you wrote one of the most famous sketches, uh, Living in a Van Down by the River, the Chris Farley sketch. Motivational speaker, yeah. That was that was to die for. It's one of those that lives on yeah, and on and on. Um, just It's real one quick. of my favorite things I ever did in show business. Really? My daughter asked me once, What's your favorite thing you've done? And I said it was doing this sketch at Second City every night for us the summer that I was there. And I wrote it for Chris, and he wouldn't quit until he made every performer <laughs> laugh. You could see him making yeah, I could see. Uh, one by one they're Christine dropping. Christine Applegate and David Spade laugh. He wouldn't yeah. quit. He yeah. would just keep doing the character right in your face until you broke up. Are you happy you made the turn to drama? Um, I didn't even realize it was happening, man. All of a sudden, I'm in this drama stuff, and people are liking it. Um, yeah, it's great. Um, you know, you dig deeper into a character, and I've had such wonderful writing mm -hmm. with uh, the writers of Breaking Bad and now Better Call Saul. I've been very blessed. 
You are such a nice guy, Bob. Oh, well, I'm so nice happy. Nice. I, I hope people read this book. It's called Comedy, 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 Drama. It's full of not just stories about the business, but also stories about your life. And I think yeah. a lot of people are going to enjoy them. And also, if you're starting out in the business and you're wondering, can I take a crack at this? Yeah. This book is definitely for you. You can find more of it at today.com. Love Bob Odenkirk. Mr. Show, one of my favorite shows to this day. Bob Odenkirk's new memoir is available now. And coming up, we're dedicating our From the Vault segment to Oscar winner Javier Bardem. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. NBC News, streaming free now. Hallie Jackson now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to Popstar Plus. Javier Bardem earned another Oscar nomination this year, his fourth, if you're keeping track at home, this time for his portrayal of Ricky Ricardo in Being the Ricardos. Of course, he won the Academy Award for his performance as a psychopath assassin in No Country for Old Men. What a movie that was back in 2008. Well, he spoke to today about that part. Here is today's From the Vault. The Coen brothers have a new thriller out. It is called No Country for Old Men, and it has taken home two Golden Globes. The movie is set in 1980s West Texas. It's the chilling tale of three lives that intersect. When one makes a life-changing discovery worth millions, another hunts him down to get it back, and the third tries to set it all right. Academy Award-nominated actor Javier Bardem stars in No Country for Old Men. Good morning to you. Good morning. You know, like a lot of the characters you run into in this movie, your character runs into, I was blown away. <laughs> Literally, by the movie, by the acting, by everything about it. By the way, congratulations on the Golden Globe, Thank Best you very Supporting much. Actor. I was sorry you didn't get to walk down the red carpet. Was that sort of a bummer? Um, uh, honestly, yeah, no. Yeah, honestly. No, because you, really? you don't have to get dressed and do the carpet. You guys are in the sofa on the coach and having a drink and So relax. you're sitting in your underwear <laughs> watching it essentially? Well, I don't I don't I don't know if I will be on my underwear, but I <laughs> definitely was watching it on TV. Yeah. Well, so many people <laughs> thought you would get that nod. So were you surprised or just Uh I I'm, I'm quite surprised about everything I I have to say since the very first moment I did the movie having in mind that I'm a Spanish actor doing a movie with the Coen brothers, that's quite a surprise. So Everything beyond that is kind of a gift for me. I think it's extraordinary the impact that the movie No Country for All Men has had in people, has in people, why and do you will think have in people. Why do you think it's had that impact? I don't know. I think it's about the coins, about their work, about their talent, about how they are able to put together such a big masterpiece of a book by Cormac McCarthy and, and put it out there in a very... Uh, beautifully constructed way but also easy easy to for everybody but at the same time profound in in the way that uh, there's a big statement behind the movie that makes the movie more powerful is uh, is beyond entertainment it's something that it's it has its own weight you know you, you talk about the effort of the Coen brothers but you yourself you had to create this character Shigur and you had little to go on mm -hmm. in the book about all you know is that the guy has blue eyes which mm -hmm. you don't, don't have, have and yet you create this this very menacing mm -hmm. presence with the gate and the toying costing and obviously the killing how do you even go about creating Shigur what, what was the process like for you um, I guess it's about really 
trying to bring what he represents, which is kind of the symbolic idea of violence, into a human behavior, which unfortunately we know, we are aware of that in a lot of behaviors out there. Uh, we, we are part of the violence and we have violence inside. Whatever we like it or not, we have to face it and we have to uh, really control it. Uh, he can't and that's the way you have to more or less understand where he's coming from, what he wants and try to put it out there and create this character that is just that, a violent machine. But was it hard to inhabit that character? Because just to watch you mm -hmm. is difficult. I don't know, I, I don't think it was especially hard. Uh, it was very hard to wear that haircut, <laughs> but it's not very, really hard to be him just because it's just fiction. It's not something that you take with you when you get back to the hotel. Yeah, tell me about the haircut because a lot of thought went into that. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a very good idea of the coins. They did it, they, that's, uh, it came from them, and I think it's very helpful because make the whole character totally insane because it goes so against what he represents, this beautiful um, Prince Valiant kind of haircut that uh, it's totally, I don't know, uh, opposite what, of what it should be. Now, after you play a role like this, do you want to just do a something light-hearted, mm -hmm. silly? Uh, well, yeah, maybe. I don't. Know. I don't think in that terms. I just think about what the quality of the role is, and if I mean, I mean, I don't want to kill anybody else in the next <laughs> I'm glad couple of years <laughs> in movies. I mean, so, no, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it's a pleasure to meet you. Thank Congratulations. You. Good luck with the Oscar nomination. Something tells me we'll be hearing your name a lot more <laughs> in the weeks and months ahead. Thank you. And guess what? It just so happens to be Javier Bardem's birthday today. So, Javier, happy birthday to you out there. Another pop star plus in the books. Tomorrow we've got one of the stars of the Gilded Age. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome to Today All Day. All day? Today all day. All day. This is a long oh, way of man. asking yeah. who's your favorite okay. character you've ever played. Oh, the right. unicorn. The unicorn. You gotta have the unicorn. <laughs> What is she right there? That's why you're saying all these nice things? Yeah, she gave me the, the look. Sorry to disturb your day. Everyone's mad at you, Willie. Better make this fast. I don't want the wrath of Luna. When I see you, I always think, I wonder what his quote would be. Give us six minutes and we'll ask as many questions as we can. Welcome to Cold Cuts. Cold Cut. Cold Cut. Hi, buddy cow. Cooking with me. Dad's no babysit. It's called parenting. What was the first book you remember loving? Heart Smart Today, with simple exercises to strengthen your heart. Make the most of your beach days. It's all about the tracksuit now. How wow. good do they look? I now pronounce you husband and wife. Kiss the bride. This morning, a story of people helping people. You've received tons of letters from people who have been inspired. Let's do the weather out. <laughs> OK. All you got to do is say, it's cold, it's warm, it's raining, it's snowing. That's it. One of our most favorite yes. franchises ever, wow. Ambush Makeovers. Okay. <laughs> look at it. It doesn't, it doesn't look so good. No, it doesn't look good. Will you okay. judge us in a cook-off? I yes. will. And okay. you guys will definitely win something. Today, all day. All day? All day. Welcome to Today, All Day. special series Together We Rise. We are celebrating the experiences, cultures, and trailblazers shaping America. Okay, and today we want you to meet the designer behind some of the boldest looks you're seeing across Hollywood and in your Instagram feed. Take a look. 
This is Christopher John Rogers' world. I kind of feel like every day is a pinch me moment. Colors so bright, a future even brighter. In the last two years, Christopher John Rogers has been awarded CFDA's Emerging Artist of the Year, Vogue Fashion Fund's top prize, and he was named one of Forbes 30 Under 30. You've had a really crazy couple of years. Yeah. That makes it seem like this happened overnight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I know that's not true. I knew that, that this is where I wanted to end up, but I didn't know how I would get there. Working full-time jobs and then coming home in the evening, cutting fabric, sketching, you know, taking my lunch break to go to fittings or going to factories. Two to three years after I moved to New York City was really when I started to sort of see things happen. I also read that church, going to church, yeah. was kind of an inspiration for all this too. Absolutely. How, how so? I think that was kind of like my weekly fashion show in a way. I mean, every Sunday, like going to church and seeing people in head to toe green or head to toe white or head to toe yellow, these really sort of ostentatious colors, but sort of presented in a really straightforward, pragmatic way was really inspiring to me. As a kid, Christopher used whatever scraps of material he could find to bring his creative vision to life. I can't help but think of your grandma and your parents like seeing something in you, yeah. but allowing you the freedom to really grow into whoever you wanted to be. Right. But how, did, how did that play into all of this? One thing I really appreciate about my family, my friends, and all the people that are around me is that I, I never felt um, strange or weird or like I didn't fit in. And I think kind of just really being able to explore who I was without limits and all of the nuances of myself and the things that I was interested in and the people that are around me were interested in really sort of led me to this, this place. Christopher's work seems to be everywhere you look, from Beyonce to Cynthia Nixon, Lizzo to Vice President Kamala Harris. But it's dressing the everyday woman that drives Christopher's designs. Initially when I start a collection and when I think of pieces, I really think of our clients and so real people or people who aren't necessarily celebrities. But I think it's always really exciting to be able to know that you sort of touch someone from an aesthetic point of view and from an emotional point of view. What happens when somebody that hasn't worn this type of vibrant, saturated beauty before, like what happens when somebody puts on your clothes when they're not used to wearing something that you make? One story that I've heard is that um, when they put on these clothes for the first time, it sort of reminded them of being a kid. Mm -hmm. And they sort of released all of the expectations of what it must mean to dress like an adult or to be chic. And I think really sort of making clothes that allow you to flux and flow between a childlike exploration, fashion, and fantasy, and really sort of needing to navigate the real world as an adult, I think is exciting. Your fourth grade self creating like comic books out of garbage bags, yeah, yeah, yeah. could he have even dreamt of this? But I think he did and it's kind of crazy to be here. There are millions of clothes in the world and for all of these different types of folks to find themselves in the work, it's really beautiful and it makes me really happy. I couldn't be more grateful. Don't you love I can't. that answer? I think he did, and now look where he is. His grandmother has passed away, mm. but he said to me, I know she would be looking oh. down and be so, so proud oh. of everything that he's created. And it's super cool. So that his team that he's working with now is the same group of friends he met freshman year at Savannah School of Design, College of Art and Design. But it tells you everything. And what he touched on that said it made you remember what it was like to be a kid yes. but still be a grown-up, he hit something. It's like hits a nerve. When you, you walk in to a studio it's like everything yeah. is bright and there's something about that he also said he likes one element of each dress to be slightly off, off. because he doesn't want people to feel like they need to be perfect, perfect. okay crazy about him now tonight with joshua johnson streaming weeknights at eight on nbc news now you think it's been healthy for the democratic party to highlight the division in the party what does an exit ramp for putin look like that allows him to save face how much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now.
You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. We are back with Mr. Smith Goes To. And Tom's still in his PJs. And yeah. by the Winter Olympics, <laughs> Harry decided to take a trip downtown to explore one of New York's most vibrant areas, Chinatown. Good morning, Harry. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Really, it does. <laughs> There's a lot of room in here. If you, <laughs> you, you, you guys let me know. It's like Snuggies for your legs. Right. Tell you what, you know, with the, uh, the Olympics over, and one of the th sort of sad things about that, because of COVID restrictions, mm -hmm. it's like our folks or even the athletes couldn't get around yeah. to sample the local culture, really, right? Mm -hmm. But you know, a lot of places around the country. The Chinese culture is alive and well in New York City, for instance, the biggest Chinese population in the United States, half a million people. We went down to Chinatown in Manhattan to get a little taste. A walk through New York's Chinatown is a food lover's dream journey. Our first stop, a grocery store. This is such a pure window into a thousand-year-old culture and cuisine. Our guide is Francis Lamb, writer, publisher, and host of The Splendid Table on public radio. Anywhere you travel is you go to the market. You go see what people shop for. You go see what people eat. You go see what's important to people. Lamb's mother shopped here, as have generations of Chinese. For here is a wall of ramen. I am probably 45% by body weight noodle. There are all these different noodles, rice noodles, Thai style, Japanese style. But the dried foods are the pride of Po Wing Fong Food Market. Delicacies. These are dried abalones. Pricey. Oh, they're wild, 220 bucks a pound. Delicious. It right. doesn't taste like a fresh oyster, it just tastes like the evil superhero version of an oyster. Like it's just darker, <laughs> moodier, you know, it's like Batman. Sophia Sao is in charge here. But it's her mother who has been behind the counter for as long as anyone can remember. What does it mean to you to follow in your family's footsteps to, to be running this store now? For me personally, I like to think that I'm continuing their legacy. So I think that I'm not only just helping my family financially, but also the community. Hang around a grocery store long enough and you'll get hungry. What's our next stop? I want to take you to the second coming of a classic tofu shop that was sort of more in the heart of Chinatown. Inside, we watch the modern day version of the ancient alchemy of tofu. Paul Ang is the proprietor of Fong An Tofu Shop. It's starting to coagulate, and so now I'm going to cover it, and yeah. it will set kind of like, a, like jello. The finished product, though, the texture of silk on your tongue serve sweet or savory. But you have that really, really creamy pudding. You get like the crunch of that shallot. And you get like the little crispiness of the pickles. We tried both. It's really one of those where's this been all my life sort of taste experiences. On we wandered, wanting to stop everywhere and taste even what we did not recognize. She said you can eat it raw if you want. What do you think? Oh my God, this is so good. It's like a, if a cucumber and a pear had a baby. The energy in Chinatown is palpable, but life here is not what it once was. In January of 2020, yeah. people stopped coming to Chinatown because it was the China virus. Many a store shuttered, some permanently. It's the economic devastation that we felt all over the country, but you layer on top of that a rise in hate crimes, a rise in racist rhetoric, a rise of scapegoating. It's rough, man. It's rough. Yet people persevere, and perhaps no place better represents that than our last stop. Waiyan, Chinese fine dining. Chef Shen Lei Tang, son of the original chef, holds forth in the kitchen. Among the specialties, sesame noodles. It's killer, right? Yeah. It's like a little bit of garlic, a little bit of scallion. But you can taste everything, and every flavor kind of comes and goes. 
honestly, I've, I heard, okay, we're gonna go have cold sesame noodles at this really <laughs> fancy restaurant. <laughs> this, it's like, this great, exceeds, sign me up. Yeah. exceeds my expectations. Far exceeds. The shredded beef, best I've ever had. And the key? How come your food is so much better than everybody else's? Cooking from your heart. Cooking from your heart. Cooking from your heart, Perfect. right? What a beautiful story. Isn't that the story. truth? But Chinatown, it's, it just, it, the life is on the street there. Mm. Yes. You just feel the vibrancy as you walk around, and you kind of go, what's that? What's this? Stop in here. Stop in there. Taste a little of this. Taste a little well, of I'm that. I'm glad you did that, because some of us, we want to go, but we just don't know what we're buying or what to look for. Like right. that one thing that looked like a cucumber. I don't even know what it's called. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing, was Francis didn't even know what it was. Really? That was the coolest was part. Was it sweet? It what well it was tastes like a lemon and a zucchini and a cucumber huh. all at the same wow. time. I'm going to Fang Ung for tofu. Yeah. That looks oh amazing. amazing. Looks oh, amazing. Oh, phenomenal. Great, yeah. And they just scoop a little layer Ooh. off yeah. at a time. And, and it's a reminder of all the treasures there. You could spend Absolutely. a week in, yep. in Chinatown in New York City and That's find true. new places. Without question. The other thing about it also is one of the reasons we live in our cities is the amazing diversity. Amen. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. my and God. And cities all over the, all over the country. There right? are places yeah. we yeah. should visit. In the fall of 1960, Ruby Bridges was a six-year-old girl who just wanted to go to school. Instead, she became an icon, thanks in part to this Norman Rockwell painting that shows her being harassed as she is escorted by federal marshals to a previously all-white school in New Orleans. But Ruby was not alone that day. This morning, for the first time ever on network television, the other three members of the New Orleans Four tell their story with a new twist. NBC's Rahima Ellis has our Sunday Spotlight. Didn't have no clue that the color of my skin made a big difference in where I had to go to school. You could hear the, the mob saying these things. This was an angry crowd. It looked like if they could get to me, they'd kill me, and I didn't know why. The why is rooted in America's painful history of segregation. So when Gail Atien, Leona Tate, and Tessie Prevost Williams were only six years old and chosen to desegregate this school in New Orleans in the fall of 1960, they faced a tidal wave of opposition. And my daddy said, give me your hand, look straight ahead, I'm here. Federal marshals make sure no harm Also there were U.S. Marshals assigned to protect the girls, just as other marshals protected Ruby Bridges at another school not far away. Her story has become legendary, but a producer documenting New Orleans history says there's more to tell. Not to take away from what Ruby Bridges did, but it becomes much more powerful when they know that there was this hurricane of things happening all simultaneously. Gail, Leona, and Tessie now finally more vocal about what they endured in a school ultimately abandoned by white students. Where was everybody else? They came the first day of school and the parents started yanking them out. We had three little girls with a whole school to ourselves. But there was no freedom. This is our first grade classroom and these windows were papered up. No one could see in and we couldn't see outside. What was the reason? It was for our protection because of the mob. Couldn't even use a pencil sharpener. All right. Because it was too close to the window. Mm -hmm. Their childhood turned upside down for a cause. They spent the first grade confined. In this room. In this room. Not the cafeteria, nope. not the playground. Never. This room. It took a heavy toll. I was six years old on nerve medicine for a while. Because what we went through, as little kids, it wasn't normal. In the years that followed, in different schools, there were no U.S. Marshals protecting them. Was it rough? It was terrible. Rough is not the word. They spit on us, they tore our clothes off, ripped our dresses and spit in our food, and Gail was hit with a bat. The taunting and abuse eventually lessened. The story slipped into the shadows of history. Just visiting all those schools and the children didn't know about us. Determined to change that, Leona set out to acquire the old abandoned school. Today, with the help of a grant from the National Park Service, 
it will become a center for education and affordable housing, named for the three women. It's got to be a place where we need to talk, to share some dialogue. A place where a difficult past can help inform a better future. For Sunday Today, Rahima Ellis, New Orleans. Rahima, thank you very much. You can hear more stories like that one, honoring the legacy and impact of America's civil rights movement at VoicesOfTheCivilRightsMovement.com. NBC News, streaming free now. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Do you think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Do you think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. NBC News, streaming free now. For this team, Mount Everest isn't just a place, it's a dream. The Full Circle Everest Expedition, currently training to become the first all-black climbing group to summit the world's tallest peak. Records show about 10,000 people have reached its summit in 70 years. Only 10 of those climbers have been black, with only one black American. Hopefully we can come back to the U.S. and uh, kind of teach other people how to have these big kind of adventures and go out and kind of see the world uh, as we share our experience with that. Fred Campbell is part of the team looking to shatter barriers at the top. So do you think this is just about sort of barriers to access? Yeah, I, I think that's part of it. I think that barriers to access is a big part. I think that uh, representation is another part. I mean, you don't see very many black climbers. And so I, I know it's a lot easier for me to imagine myself doing something if there are people that I kind of connect with. Campbell was a college football standout at Stanford until he broke his neck while playing. With football out of his future, he turned his sights to the great outdoors, learning to skydive and climb, ascending Mount Kilimanjaro with his father. I fell in love with it because it was the first time that I got to kind of do some travel and see the rest of the world. It was this incredibly intense experience where it was like physically demanding in a way that really... Uh, that I connected with. Now he's part of a history making team. Among them, 28 year old climbing instructor Rosemary Saul, high school teacher Eddie Taylor, and team leader Philip Henderson, a 58 year old climber with three decades of experience. How does it feel to be climbing with other people who look like you and have had similar experiences? It's a lot of fun. I think that uh, we have some similar backgrounds, like similar experiences growing up, similar tastes in music. And so it, there's a lot of uh, connection and it's really easy to kind of get along and kind of like uh, crack jokes and have fun. So it's, uh, it's a blast. This team ready to make history at the highest level and in the highest place. What do you hope? that other people take away from seeing you, from seeing this black team climb the highest mountain in the world? 
I hope that they see our experience and how much we love being out on the mountain and kind of enjoying the adventure and they're inspired to find an adventure of their own. So all nine members will start their ascent this May, and some of them have bonded during training here stateside, like ascending Washington's Mount Rainier last year, along with a scouting trip to Everest's home country, Nepal. But the biggest and the tallest test, guys, it lies ahead of them, bringing their excellence to unprecedented mm -hmm. heights. Indeed. I'd live stream right? that. I would yeah. watch yeah. that whole yeah. climb yeah. if I could. I told them I would make them a playlist. I don't know okay. if there's okay. a yeah. long there. playlist. Yeah. Yeah. To you know what? That Wi-Fi up there, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, not that good. I'll have to download it for Maybe a little satellite. That's a really cool story. <laughs> I know. Uh, way to go, Love Morgan. That. Really yeah. cool, Morgan. Thank, thank, thank you. So you. Much. My name is Alex Slinka. I'm 18 years old, and I'm an amateur bodybuilder as well as a full-time college student. If people ask me, I always say I'm not a transgender bodybuilder. I do not want to be labeled as a transgender bodybuilder. I'm a bodybuilder that happens to be trans. <laughs> For me, being transgender is not something that should limit you or define you. Mm. Come on. Mm. So tell me about your clients, Alex. I, I understand that you got another two yesterday, yeah, right? Yeah, so between a bunch of toys, he would, she, at that point, she would have chosen a truck or a blue toy or blue clothes. He never really was into playing with girls or dolls, and his friends were always Boys. I really started realizing there was something wrong when I started to feel societal expectations of being a female. And that made me very uncomfortable the way people saw me and how I physically projected myself to the world. Not to be morbid, but it's like complete utter disgust with yourself and your body, and you get anxiety like from other people seeing you a certain way. And I was like, you know what? Like, I, I can't do this anymore. I can't not talk about it anymore. Um, I need to tell someone. And uh, he just basically told me that, Mom, I truly believe I am transgender. And at that time, I don't think I understood what that actually means. And she admitted, she was like, I really don't know what you're saying, but you're my child and like, I love you no matter what. Can anyone succeed like a uh, performance level bodybuilding without a trainer? Yeah. He's been very open to us because we've been always open to him and we supported him in any circumstances. Therefore, he's had no fear to talk to us. Other parents out there who are going through the similar situation, we highly advise them to continue loving and supporting their children no matter what, they're not doing anything wrong. They're just trying to manifest themselves as they feel they are inside. After my surgery, I kind of just looked at myself in the mirror very objectively. I was like, you're very, very skinny. I look very weak and like, I don't want to look weak. I just wanted to be a little more fit and be more comfortable with myself. But for me, I've always had the personality like all or nothing. So like when I get it, when I get into something, I really get into it. I've done the hard work that's been done. It's just relaxing, practice posing, and uh, you know, the show. And that's it. I mean, this has been a crazy experience. Uh, this is my mom. Say hi. Hi. It felt so amazing to get on stage and pose. Literally felt like the universe was telling me, like, you are doing what you're supposed to be doing. And it was just so empowering. Alex, When the show host raised Alex's hand in the air. It was fantastic. I'm sure there's people that think I should not be able to compete with the other men, but quite frankly, it's not really up to them. It's up to the people that make the shows and they're very accepting. And I think the reason for it is because they understand where I come from. Most bodybuilders, especially the men, get into bodybuilding because of insecurity. They understand that I come from a place that I'm just trying to better my body, better my mind, and they respect that and they encourage that. It doesn't matter if I'm trans or not. 
I had people uh, DM me all the time um, saying that, you know, like, I didn't think I could look this way, but like seeing you has really made me realize I can. And for me, like that literally makes me so emotional because I remember coming from a place where my biggest insecurity when I first transitioned was, that's great, I can transition, I can call myself a guy, but I will never ever look the way I want to look. If I could help like one or two people just feel better about themselves, that like makes me feel like everything I'm doing is worth it. It's time for a little morning boost. We could use this one. A teddy bear lost during a family trip is back where he belongs after becoming a star on social media. So Teddy was found last month in Milwaukee's airport. Employees posted pictures of him on social media, grabbing a cup of coffee, training to become a pilot. Anyway, <laughs> lots of people enjoyed his adventures. Five days later, the Teddy's family spotted that missing bear. My wife was sitting there and a friend of hers shared it via Facebook. It was just a, a fun story. And um, she was just on her phone and then she just jumped up and she said, she couldn't even speak. <laughs> and uh, I looked at him like, that's his bear, <laughs> without even a doubt. Well, there's five-year-old oh. Ezekiel Burnett. You know what happened was he actually tossed the teddy up into the air when they were getting ready to get on their flight. It got stuck in the rafters. Ah. And their parents were like, we don't have time to get it. We got to catch the fight. We got to catch the flight. So they left. He was heartbroken. And look what happens oh, at the end. How, it all they worked both out. look happy Is in that picture. <laughs> I, know, exactly. I love that. All right, a family that loves to hit the slopes together attached a microphone to their four-year-old, four-year-old snowboarder. The result was adorable. It was a, like a little motivational video. Check it out. This way, you'll slip. I won't fall. Maybe okay. I will. That's okay. Can we all fall? That's my dad. Okay, I can't. <laughs> Oh. Let's go down this big old hill. <laughs> okay, is that amazing? Totally calming himself down, having a lot of fun. That's a little Auburn Sage, fell a couple of times, but what a great attitude she has. Look, this oh, way. I love her. I won't fall. Maybe I will. I won't fall. Maybe, Maybe I, I will. will. Those are words to live yes, by. Yes, you know good what? girl. Just keep going. Yeah, that was awesome. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. All right, let's get a morning boost. Let's do it, let's do it. Okay, so a woman in Florida gave her grandfather a little gift, and that little gift had with it a big secret. So he unwrapped it, and then it took him a second to realize what it all meant. Take a look. <laughs> what? The great and grandpa. Okay, Great. Are you going to be a great... What? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, the mug did read you put the great in Grandpa, so mm. he didn't quite connect that. But I love he was just like hugging her with for a yeah, mug, and now he's nice. like, yeah. He's anyway. like, that's great, honey. What? <laughs> I love Maybe that. do an August battle. There are a few things that make me happier than physically farming. Big, sweaty, kind of brutal tasks. 
I think I've always known in some form that this farm and this work around connecting people and land needed to exist. <laughs> you wanna be free of your anxiety. That's so catchy. I think the wind likes it. <laughs> My name is Leah Penniman and I'm the founding co-director at Soulfire Farm in Grafton, New York. Soulfire Farm is a black indigenous led community farm that's dedicated to ending racism in the food system and training up the next generation of activist farmers. Between 1 and 2% of farms are black owned, which is down from a peak of 14% of black owned farms in 1910. And this is not because black folks don't want to farm. This is because of a whole legacy of discrimination of institutional racism. I grew up in a small rural town called Ashburnham, Massachusetts. I'm the oldest of three and we were, for most of our childhood, the only brown kids in our entire school and we experienced just a lot of social exclusion and racial bullying. It ranged from taunting, you know, being called names, to assumptions about our intelligence. The land and the forest were a salvation for me. I attended every single farming conference that I could afford to go to, but by my late teens, early 20s, I started to get disillusioned because I'd look around at these farming conferences and all the presenters were white and I looked around and there was only a handful of people of color. A mentor of mine said something so important to me at that time. You know, she was just like, look, don't give up. I know that right now it seems like you're out of place, but remember that our ancestors have been farmers for millennia and that our ancestors built the agricultural system of this country on their backs. I was really grateful that she was there and encouraged me to stick with it. My partner Jonah and I were living in the south end of Albany, New York with our then infant children, Nishima and Emmett. And despite our master's degrees and over a decade of farming experience, found it impossible to get fresh food for our children. There were no supermarkets, no farmer's markets, no available community garden plots. The only food is a corner store, a liquor store, and a McDonald's. This system of segregation uh, is termed by the government a food desert. To us, there's nothing natural about apartheid. Um, so we call it what it is, it's food apartheid. It comes out of a legacy of redlining and housing discrimination, of divestment from communities of color, and has resulted in the situation today where if you're white, you're four times as likely to have a supermarket on your block than if you're black. You're more likely to have diabetes, heart disease, and other diet-related illnesses. Not because you don't know how to eat, but because there you know, is a scarcity of affordable, culturally appropriate quality food um, that's accessible. And so we work to establish a community garden right on the corner plot near our home. So when our neighbors found out that we knew how to farm, they encouraged us to start the farm for the people. And the idea for Soul Fire Farm was born. We purchased the land in 2006 and it took us four years to transform this marginal, degraded and vacant land into human habitat and suitable farmland. And we opened the farm in 2011 with a small food distribution program that went right to our neighbors in the South End. A couple thousand folks roll through here every year to attend our farm training programs. The rest of you are just going to contemplate um, and pray for <laughs> the strawberries. Happy, happy um, homemaking. There are eight of us working here on the farm. We have an amazing team. We have a number of day-long programs and week-long camps for youth who are interested in farming and a whole lot of community days and workshops on particular skills. It's really whatever our community is asking us for, we do our best to provide. Our most popular is the week-long BIPOC FIRE, stands for Black Indigenous People of Color, Farming in Relationship with Earth. We have folks coming from 37 states and three countries this year, Spanish and English speakers, young and old. And we spend a week together uh, doing hands on the land training. Uh, we have a number of courses on business management, marketing, uh, as well as crop planning. If you count everyone who's gone through any program, we have over 10,000 alumni. We provide ongoing and forever mentorship. We hook folks up with jobs, uh, land, fellowships, and other opportunities. You know, land is the place where the lynchings, the beatings, the enslavement, the sharecropping took place. And so there's no way to escape the trauma associated with that. And so a big part of what I and we are trying to do at Soulfire is to 
reach back across the narrative of the hundreds of years of land-based oppression to Cleopatra's you know, compost piles and the raised beds of the Ovambo people in Namibia, to reach back to the work of Dr. George Washington Carver, creating regenerative agriculture, and Dr. Booker T. Watley with Farm to Table. So to really reclaim the dignity of it is super important. If we can't feed ourselves, we can't truly be free. All right, so everyone who's part of the tour, just come a little bit get started. We're gonna travel around the farm together, get a chance to visit some of the sacred sites, hear the stories, and you can ask your questions as well as we go. So follow me this way. Community Farm Day is our monthly public event where volunteers come from all around the region to share in the labor of the land, to have a potluck lunch, and then to participate in a tour and Q&A session. It's the one time that the farm's open to the public. Now what's very important with strawberries is that their meristem or growth point is right here. So what do you think happens if you bury that? Drowning. It will not grow. <laughs> <laughs> we have a bunch of different teams working on different tasks, um, including transplanting the fall strawberries, uh, cleaning and curing the garlic and onions, harvesting potatoes, removing some of the materials and supplies that we're done with for the season. And Jonah will be working with some volunteers, many of whom have traveled three or four hours just to get here today. We have a lot of teens that come through the farm and not all of them are gonna be farmers, but they see folks who look like them following their dreams and being their own bosses and running their own institutions. What matters to me is that they can see a wider vision of what's possible for their own lives. This is what we're trying to get yeah. to, so it's great to see it in person. Yeah, just a goal. It makes my heart flutter, <laughs> like honestly, I just like, I'm so inspired. you should please help all the teams clean up and put everything away. We do doorstep delivery of vegetables, eggs, pastured meat, and herbs, and folks can actually pay for that using their EBT benefits. The vast majority of people say that having those vegetables has made a huge difference in their health, whether that's a reduction in you know, blood pressure or cholesterol or overall sense of well-being. And especially for our lower income members, many of them say if it wasn't for those vegetables, they'd literally be eating ramen and boiled pasta and canned foods because they simply don't have anywhere to get, you know, fresh food like we offer. There's nothing that makes me happier than seeing our alumni farm. So for example, Dallas Robinson in North Carolina uh, just recently opened the Harriet Tubman farm. Folks like Keisha Cameron outside of Atlanta, Georgia at High Hog Farm. Fundamentally, I wanna create a different kind of educational environment for young people that I never got to experience where you know, you can go ahead and be proud to be a soil nerd and you also will have your culture uplifted, your heritage uplifted and be affirmed for who you are and and encouraged to pursue your wildest dreams. I see Leah and I like stand there and I listen to her and I'm just in complete awe. Like, like I feel a physical reaction in my body and I just want to like be quiet and listen. I've had mixed feelings in the past around doing public speaking. It always seemed like the real work was here on the farm and then I'd go out and just talk about the real work. And something shifted for me when I witnessed how many people who heard our talks then went on to join a program to learn how to farm, or did something like give away their land to a black farmer. It's really an honor and pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, I feel excited, I feel deeply pleased to talk about two of my favorite things, which are the earth and the ancestors and what they want us to be up to. Go caps, you're gonna grow so strong. So we wrote this song. Our waiting list for our training programs is years long. Mm -hmm. Our people are yearning, right? Mm -hmm. Some of us confuse the scene of the crime, which was the land, with the crime. Mm -hmm. But the fact is the land has always had our back. In fact, we survived because of that connection with the land. My hope is that we spread our love, our knowledge, our resources out through the network of black and brown farmers so that 
you know, 10, 20 years from now, people will be like, wait, what's Soul Fire again? Because there's literally right around the corner a black and brown led teaching farm so that it becomes so commonplace that we have to remind our children about a time when all the land was white owned and a time when all the farmers were exploited because that's become such a distant memory. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Butchery is seen as this really large scale brute force thing and it takes a lot of physical strength, but a lot of it is also really intricate and small kind of meditative moments. Sausage making being one of those things. The color is still really nice. Yeah, it looks beautiful. I'm Karen Nicoletti, I'm a fourth generation butcher and co-founder of Seymour Meats and Veggies. <laughs> I want butchers in the future to not be scared of people eating less meat. I just think that we need to get a little bit more creative about our job. Everyone, the food is ready. The mission really is to make it easier and more fun for people to eat well. It turns out that adding vegetables, making that meat stretch farther, democratizes good meat, if you will, uh, makes it more available to more people. They're just so good. <laughs> my family's history in butchery started uh, with my great-great-grandfather. He was a cattle merchant in Russia. That was where my great-grandpa started working in the meat industry. And then he opened a shop in the north end of Boston in the 1940s with some of his family. When my grandpa was 13, him and his brother Bobby started working in the shop and eventually took it over. Is that you? That's me. Yeah. That's Bob. I'm Seymour Celeste, and I'm a retired butcher. Both of us went to work helping my dad in the meat market. My brother and I were partners until the day he passed away a couple years ago. This was the store. Wow. 65 Salem Street. I had three daughters. I never thought that uh, my girls would be interested, and they weren't. My daughters used to bring the children into my office for me to take care of them while they went out and did things. And uh, Kara always wanted to go into the smelly room. I was, out of my sisters and my cousins, probably the most curious about what they were doing in the shop. Growing up, I always wanted to sort of like peek behind the curtain and see. I graduated in 2008, the economy collapsed. <laughs> I was working at a restaurant as a baker and one of the owners who also had a grandfather who was a butcher was like, if you ever want to do some like light butchery work, breaking down chickens and pork shoulders and stuff, 
let me know. So I started doing that and it sort of like sparked an interest in me. So I started apprenticing for free. I did that for about a year and then left to go butcher full time. I remember calling my papa, Seymour, when I got my first apprenticeship. I could tell that he was hoping like it was something that didn't stick. Well, I said, you know, this is the, the funniest story, the funniest joke. You're joking with me and everything else? And she said, no. I really have my entire working life worked with my hands and I enjoy that much more. I trusted her and believed in her. As a matter of fact, I gave her some of my tools. This is um, Papa's Seymour's honing steel that he gave me. As soon as I started butchering full time, I gravitated toward sausage making immediately. And I realized pretty early on that I had like, hit on an idea. As much as I believe in regenerative agriculture and all of that, there's just no way to sustainably eat meat every single night of the week. So I started sneaking a lot of vegetables into my sausages. I had set out to make 40 pounds of sausages and after I'd mixed it all together, I weighed out the mix and it was like 70 something pounds. I had essentially doubled my meat <laughs> by adding vegetables to it. When I was working at Foster's and just like couldn't physically keep up with the demand was when I realized that it definitely was a scalable idea. It's been the last two years of working nonstop trying to get this to market. Uh, I went to close to 100 co-packers asking them if they would help me and every single one of them said no because what we're doing is more complicated. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start a conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Do you think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. NBC News, streaming free now. Do you think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start a conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Allie Jackson now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Do you think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. NBC News, streaming free now. We finally found one co-packer outside of uh, Kansas City, Missouri, the Phantasmas, and flew out to go see them, and they were like, sure, we'll try it. Hey! Hi! <laughs> How's it going? Good, how are you? Oh, oh hi, <laughs> Hi! I really owe everything to them because they saw something in me, and they saw something in my idea that they thought was worth taking a risk on. I was making Lou and Mario like <laughs> peel beets and dice them in thing that makes bologna. I believe it was the challenge. Uh, we never done sausage with vegetables and meat combined at the amounts uh, that she was looking for. We immediately saw uh, the drive that she had, the passion she had about the sausages she made. We've always wanted to work with a sausage queen. <laughs> Oh, 
Oh my gosh! Vivi, do you want to help me prep some vegetables? We went back and forth and back and forth about the name for a long time. We had a few different iterations that just didn't stick, and I always wanted it to be Seymour. These are cooking up fantastic. <laughs> uh, look at those. They're just cooking up. Gorgeous. Gorgeous. I love her, and I said to her, no, 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 don't call it Seymour Meats and Vegetables. I wanted her to call it something like Kara's Kitchen because it really, you know, it's her. And of course, I am humbled by what she did. And uh, um, I'm very emotional about that. We are all obsessed with Seymour. We love him and use him as a model of, of positivity and gratitude. That delicious. So this is about honoring my whole family. The truth of the matter is, Kara revolutionized the a sausage business. Make no mistake, this was not an easy process and I almost quit many, many, many times. Kara went to Whole Foods and they bought her product immediately. I mean, I can lie awake at night thinking how remarkable it is that she was able to achieve that, and I'm very proud of her. Butchering is a really, really difficult job with very little financial payoff, but I would not do anything differently. Women make really good butchers and really good cooks, really good chefs. I think the more of us that are in this industry, the better. I understand what it takes to accomplish what she's accomplished. And let me tell you, it is no easy feat. And it didn't happen overnight for Kara. And it's just the beginning as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> I love you so much. Welcome to Today All Day. All day? Today All Day. All day. This is a long oh, way of man. asking, yeah. who's your okay. favorite character you've ever oh, played? The right. unicorn. The unicorn. You gotta have the unicorn. <laughs> What is she right there? That's why you're saying all these nice yeah, things? Yeah, she gave me the, the look. Sorry to disturb your day. Everyone's mad at you, Willie. Better make this fast. Yeah. I don't want the rap of Luna. When I see you, I always think, I wonder what his quote would be. Give us six minutes and we'll ask as many questions as we can. Welcome to Cold Cuts. Cold Cuts. Cold Cuts. Hi, buddy Cal. Cooking with me. Dad's no babysit. It's called parenting. What was the first book you remember loving? Heart Smart Today, with simple exercises to strengthen your heart. Make the most of your beach days. It's all about the tracksuit oh, now. How wow. good do they look? I now pronounce you husband and wife. Kiss the bride. NBC News, streaming free now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. Do you think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. NBC News, streaming free now. Do you think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Food, in a way, unlocks a lot of stories. It's this emotional connection that we get through eating that food that is really irreplaceable. 
My name is Chitra Agarwal. I'm a co-founder at Brooklyn Deli, where we make sauces and condiments inspired by my family's recipes from India. My name is Katevi, and I'm the chef and owner of Dumpling Club, a weekly subscription service that features a rotating menu of dumplings and Asian dishes. I started Brooklyn Deli in 2014. Our first products at Brooklyn Deli were my achars, which are a staple Indian condiment. They're kind of like this spicy, sour, a little bit sweet. So you add just a little bit and it kind of just makes the dish like amazing. I developed a lot of the recipes for achar using what I was getting in my farm share. So I was making achar from heirloom tomatoes, garlic, gooseberries. I wouldn't say that it's authentic Indian food. It's very much inspired by my heritage, but it's authentic to me. My grandfather comes from a region in northern China that, that specializes in dumplings. And to him, dumplings were the perfect food, the best food. I use all sorts of influences in the dumplings. For example, influences from my husband's Austrian side. That's not traditionally how dumplings would be made. I'm learning to be really comfortable with that. In the beginning, I felt like that wasn't truly authentic but I actually now feel that that's very authentic to me and my experience. A labor of love learned from generations before them. The pleating sort of represents on the outside the amount of care that's been put into this food. Whenever we made them as a family, seeing the pleats that my mom or that my grandfather added to the dumplings would remind me that they were the ones who prepared this food for me. father's mother, we were just very close. I can still remember the food that she would give me. I can still taste it. They're kind of like food memories from when I was really young and those continued on as I visited her every year in India. Every trip we would be in the kitchen. Growing up, we didn't have regular access to Asian groceries, but I learned about the importance of food from my mom. She would use spaghetti whenever she was making stir-fried noodles. Her creativity, that creative spirit that she had when it came to replicating her home food through whatever ingredients that she had on hand, that's what I feel really inspired by. Both women left stable jobs for their culinary careers. It was a really scary time because, I mean, I'd been working for over a decade in positions where I had benefits, I had an ongoing salary that I could count on. I left Google in the fall of 2019, and already that year I was starting to make dumplings, send them around to friends and family, and when I decided to really start in earnest was in February 2020, conveniently one month before the pandemic hit and everything shut down. I didn't have a steady job or an income at that time and whenever I had a spare moment, I'd fold dumplings and then I would stay up all hours editing footage and putting it up on Instagram and we were just trying to survive. Despite the pandemic, their businesses not only survived, but thrived our public sales tend to sell out within a few minutes. One time it sold out in less than a minute. For us, it's been great because more people want to try the flavors that we're putting out there and want to learn more about Indian food and culture. Everything that I really learned how to make, I learned from different family members. So I feel like in some sense, the Brooklyn Deli recipes also are a way for our family recipes to kind of live on. When my parents came to the States, they really came here with nothing. And I'm super cognizant of that now, that it's a huge privilege to be able to, to do what I love, to go after what I love. And that has come from years of sacrifice and hard work from my parents. And knowing that, I want to take that privilege and make sure that I do something really positive with it. From Studio 1A in Rockefeller Plaza. It is fun here, y'all. We have a great crowd. Temps are low, spirits are high. They are dead.
blacked out in red, white, and blue. Are you feeling it? The Olympic spirit. Welcome to our little cozy home on the plaza for the next two weeks. The Winter Olympics have officially kicked into high gear. That's a beauty. It's like a dream come true. <laughs> Super Bowl 56. This is who I'm tailgating with right here. All I did was dip this and oh. this, and we got that. It's time to kick off our 70th anniversary celebration. Cheers to everyone. It's a brighter third hour. That's right, it's the Polar Bear Plunge. Talk about your weather app. Woohoo! Let it snow, baby! Hi. Welcome to the making of today. It's where we reveal the secrets on how we put our little show together. And <laughs> as you just saw, we started off 2022 on a strong note. Plenty of big events, interviews, memorable moments. And we are happy to bring you all the behind the scenes things with my pals, Dylan and Chanel. Oh, we're Yay! happy to be doing this with you. He's Al Roker. Of course. This yeah. is oh, so exciting. We can't wait to share what goes into making our TV magic. But let's start with what we and the whole country had our eyes on for the last two weeks, the Winter Olympics. It was definitely thrilling to watch the finest athletes in the world compete in these Winter Games. And while you see the sights and sounds of the Olympic Park, it actually does take a TV village and then some to produce hours and hours of Olympic broadcasts. Craig, take us behind the scenes. The Olympics are always about superlatives. Does it get any more precise than that? Athletes have been practicing and competing for years just to make it here. The most fun thing is front row seat to history. So we thought we'd share our own TV production marathon. You got it. One, two, three, four, five. Behind the scenes of the Winter Games. Hey, Craig, morning. Hello to Savannah, good morning. The highly anticipated women's figure skating short program uh, has been underway behind me. First up, nearly 19 hours in the air to Beijing. Just getting to Beijing felt like an Olympic sport. Uh, we've cleared customs. Everyone who touches down in Beijing for the Winter Games is greeted by a hazmat suit wearing welcoming committee. Finally, we made it to the starting line of the Olympics. Over the course of two weeks, there's 200 hours of Olympic coverage across three platforms in six time zones for NBC. We are in our workspace at the International Broadcast Center, which is also called the IBC. We have our Today team here, small but mighty. They are amazing. And then over there, we have the NBC local affiliates. These games are like nothing we've seen before. In fact, sometimes it was hard to see anything at all. No one, just me. So right now we are shooting Craig's life in the bubble spot. We're gonna raise a glass of okay. Team USA. How is it? It's, um, it's a screwdriver. Okay. It's all right. This is terrible. <laughs> what is your most exciting moment so far in Beijing? Nathan Chen, watching him win gold in person and seeing that like sense of relief just like take over his body, that was nice. What's the hardest part about covering these Olympics? Being away from the family, no doubt. Happy Valentine's oh, Day! Pops. Oh, that's sweet. Right? Hey, you know, get, get me a little for a clip tip. At the end of these very long days and nights, none of this would be possible without our incredible crews. Uh, my name is Ray Farmer, this is Randy. Hey guys. I'm camera, Randy is audio. audio. Ricardo back here, he is the master audio technician. And Sam, you can see, is the main camera operator. 24 7, the show goes on with many more teams of dedicated people around the globe. This is the LA Bureau of the Today Show, where this spot is all going to come together. Bringing it all across the finish line, we produced 36 hours of the Today Show in 17 days. Our executive producer, Tom Mazzarelli. In our own version of the finish line, the control, where all of the work over in China, back here, in London, everywhere, makes it, it gets on the air, this is where it all happens. Uh, just really amazing what they were mm -hmm. able to pull off. A lot. Incredible. Uh, and while the Olympics were an extraordinary undertaking inside such a massive bubble, but in the end turned out to be easy compared to scoring one of those <laughs> plush 
panda mascots, uh, Bing Dwun Dwun. Yes. Bing Dwun Dwun, yes. Dwun Dwun. And if you did get your hands on one of those, you're probably, I mean, just one in a million. And actually, we had a once-in-a-lifetime event that happened this month, mm -hmm. too, the Winter Olympics and Super Bowl 56, both happening at the same time and both airing on NBC. No. <laughs> right. Seriously. Yeah. Uh, wow. Yes. So just for you and you at home, the, the team at NBC Sports celebrated with a once in a lifetime event on our show by making it snow in all of all places, Santa Monica, California. And you were right there in the center of the action. That's right. It, it was pretty amazing how this all came together in just a few hours. They were able to turn an outdoor mall in downtown sunny Santa Monica into a winter wonderland. And here's how it happened. Sunny Santa Monica, California, known for its warm weather and beautiful beaches. But that was about to change. The mission? A crazy one. Make it snow at an outdoor mall in Santa Monica where the average snowfall is 0, 0.0 inches. That's because it never happens. But we took up the challenge and assembled a team that could pull it off. Al's going to be in Santa Monica. Production manager Kylie Hose and Today Show director Jim Gaines, both at 30 Rock in New York, worked on how to make this look good on TV. And they can actually make it snow. At the Santa Monica Place Mall, where it was a balmy 70 degrees, we had to wait until after shoppers cleared out. Then we went to work. The folks at NBC Sports bringing in eight trucks filled with 40 tons of ice. 12 snowmaking machines were mounted on the roof, giving us the power to make snow on command. All of this to celebrate a once in a lifetime event, the Winter Olympics and the Super Bowl, both airing on NBC. And while the fresh powder was growing by the hour, our LA editorial team put the finishing touches on the piece that would air that morning on the Today Show. Talk about your weather app. Editor Tommy Tripotis and associate producer Sammy Davis, working from their homes, got the job done in record time. Talk about your weather app. Woohoo! Let it snow, baby. And after five hours of snowmaking, I got a chance to talk to some of our NBC affiliates from all around the country. It gets chilly here in the, in the but not so chilly. I can't get it. I can't take a pass from uh, my producer Max Paul. A fabulous thing. So here we are. Yes, uh, and and they've got snowballs at the ready. You son of a. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> turned out Max had been choreographing the 95 mile per hour ice balls for weeks. Throw it. Hey, it's not so hard. That's better. You're trying to kill me here, Koosh. After surviving these snowball attacks, the place finally looking like a chilly winter's morning. Al's on the road. He's in Santa Monica, California. That does not look like no, Santa Monica, California. No, we don't California. believe you. Mission accomplished. Uh, my producer, Max Paul, uh, making basically an ice ball. Oh, and throwing no. Those are the best hard. guys. So, but here's what, hopefully Max isn't watching because I've stored several uh, snowballs in my freezer. No way. So that next time I go to L.A., <laughs> it's coming for you, Max. Oh, now, we want to see a behind the scenes of how you get them from your freezer oh, to I've L.A. Got, I've got technology. He's got ways. <laughs> All right, well, speaking of, we showed you how we brought uh, snow to L.A. Well, Hoda and Jenna dove into freezing water for a polar plunge. We're gonna show you how that really played out when we come right back. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at eight on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at eight on NBC News Now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Prince. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? 
How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Prince. NBC News, streaming free now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to Making Up Today. So much of what you see on the air with Hoda and Jenna, it's really so fun to watch. But have you ever thought about what it takes to pull off all their stunts and celebrations? Well, you are about to see the making of the coldest and perhaps most playfully controversial <laughs> stunt in a long time. It was the first, likely not the only, annual Hoda and Jenna Polar Plunge. Bundle up as Jenna takes us along for a chilly ride. One of our favorite parts of this job is the excuse to dive into something we wouldn't normally do. And this time, we wanted to dive in, literally. To celebrate the new year, our producers brainstormed a bucket list series. And top of the list, a polar plunge. It's hard to think of things that they haven't done before. And it's January, so we thought, what about a polar bear plunge? Average temperatures in New York in January hover around 30 degrees which means our staff was questioning our willingness to commit. No way. I, I was there for the pitch of it, and I said, sure, but there is a 0% chance the ladies will do a polar plunge. We thought, oh, wow, Hoda and Jenna are not going to do this. They're going to back out. When they got down here, they seemed a little bit more apprehensive, especially about going in all the way. And then it happened. I'm shocked they're even doing this, because I don't know if I would do it. <laughs> when they get in that moment where it's like, if they're going to go all in or not, they always go all in. Hoda and Jenna always surprise me. I couldn't believe it. First of all, I would never do that. And the fact that they could do it made me feel like they were rock stars. That was like the ultimate rock star move. But the reactions to our plunging were mixed. <gasps> Wait, what? <laughs> Sparking a controversy in the now viral moment. You just put your head? I thought you said we were going to dive together. All you did was just put your head no, gently. Don't say all I did. I was all the way soaking wet. It just wasn't as dramatic. I dove under and you just went like this. Even our own staff was split. I think Jenna's right. Hoda cheated. She got her hair wet, which in the cold, getting your hair wet, that's a big deal. But still, you gotta, you gotta go all the way. I know this might be controversial, but I had to watch that piece 15 times because I was the one approving it and never once in watching it did I think Hoda Kotb did not do a polar plunge. Bucket list item officially checked off all in a day's work. Honestly, it's it's amazing that they'll say yes to the crazy stuff we come up with. Because this show is the ultimate girl party. It's invigorating because we can literally come up with anything and they're gonna do it. Shout out to the ladies for showing up ready to play, right? Or swim. Yes. Right. Tell them about the shrinkage, Jerry. <laughs> like a frightened turtle. <laughs> you just jump right in there. <laughs> Speaking of diving in, Dylan, that's uh, what you had to do, really diving right in when you returned from maternity leave. Yeah, I mean, it was it was a little tough. Yeah. I mean, you know, baby Rusty arrived earlier than expected. I was able to spend four months with him at home, as well as Cal and Ollie, of course. But after all that quality time with them, I did have to come back to work. And here's a peek of just how my first day went. After four months of maternity leave, it was time for me to go back to Studio 1A. Can you believe I'm going back to work? Yeah, you can't go back to work yet. Why? <laughs> yeah. You don't no. want me to go back to work? I don't want mommy to go back to work. Are you going to miss me? Yeah. yeah. I've got all my clothes laid out. Ready. I'm ready to go. I am like a big preparer the night before, so I've got my coffee here. Muffins made for the boys, so that they've got breakfast tomorrow. I've got all my pump parts ready to go. My outfit's picked out. I guess I'm ready. I'm up by 5 o'clock the next morning, preparing to leave without waking anyone up. I'm back. I haven't been here in so long. I don't even know what half this stuff is. Once I'm settled in, it's time to get ready. 
All right, makeup's done. I've got my notes here. I'm going to prep for our interview today with Cynthia Nixton and Christine Bransky. And I have our morning meeting phone call um, now. So I'm going to call into that. All right, now it is time to go get my hair done. Um, and does anybody recognize this sound? <laughs> Always be pumping, that's what I say. Yay, I'm back! With that, I'm pumped to walk onto the set to start the show. Hello. Hey, hey. I'm here. Good morning, everybody. It's a brighter third hour. Yeah. Can we just do one thing? Sure. Like just, shh, 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 shh. I just want to, I just want to quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <I didn't. laughs> okay, well, I did it. The show's over. Um, and to be honest, it feels like I have never left. Um, in a good way. I just feel like you just jump right back into it and I figured out my routine and it's the same routine that I had um, before I left. I think the difference is I'm going to go home now with three kids instead of two. So I feel like I might get more exhausted later on today. <laughs> I'm back and no more babies. I'm not going away anytime soon. You guys are stuck with me. So after my first day, Calvin comes home with a note, and I'm not sure if it's <laughs> good job, mom, mm -hmm. or good God, mom. Oh, wow. <laughs> either, either way, way either the way. sentiment right. was there. Very I was happy, and it's hanging on my wall, so it's nice to be back. We like that. <laughs> yes. We're glad you are back. And, and we celebrated your return, and coming up next, we're going to celebrate the Today Show. It had a momentous milestone. Don't go anywhere. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Allie Jackson now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Allie Jackson now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Prince. We recently had a big anniversary here at Today, 70 years. It was an honor celebrating with you at home and with all of New York City. That's right. And thanks to some help from our good friend, Holly Palmieri, with Today's Show Radio on Sirius XM, we got an inside look at the big milestone. It is a big anniversary. Real big. On January 14th, 2022, the Today Show marking 70 incredible years on the air. But the fun actually started the day before. Here this we go. is historic. Hey. When Oda, Carson, and I got to flip the switch and light up the Empire State Building in honor of this major milestone. To be able to flip the switch and see it go orange incredible. for us. Then it was off to Studio 1A to get to work. Rehearsals are starting. I want to show you what's going on here behind the scenes. On special show days like this, with lots of moving parts, we like to run through everything so that our crew, from everybody in the control room, folks on the set, and of course, our fellow anchors, know what the game plan is before the show gets going. Join us as we look back and toast an American institution. Today, Friday, January 14th, 
2022. After rehearsals were done, we reflected on the momentous occasion. It's pretty incredible to be here today. It's never lost on me, yeah. every day. Because right. I grew up watching the show like yeah. so many people. I right. watched Brian Gumbel when I was a little boy. I've been saying, I feel like I'm like Norm or Cliff from yeah. Cheers. Like, I just, someone in this cool place that yeah. I can sit and hang out. This was actually my idea, to bring back the old school weather chalkboard for my weather hits throughout the morning. So here's the deal. Uh, this is the way we did weather in 1952. Uh, Dave Garraway would get a call from the, the chief meteorologist at what then was called the U United States Weather Bureau. And on the air, he would tell Dave where to drive, draw the front. And Dave would do it live. He'd draw the fronts on, the low pressure, the sunshine, the rain. And of course, now we do computer graphics. And, and it's, it, but, but there's something very special about this. And then, showtime. This morning, guys, we're taking time to celebrate those seven decades of informing, inspiring, and hopefully making you smile. Yes! A huge yes! celebration for an even bigger day. Let's raise a glass, you guys, to a wonderful program that we all get to be a part of. And a big thanks to all of you who have been watching us at home for 70 years. Oh, Thank it's you been for allowing us to be a part of your family. Coming into your home. Happy 70th today! I mean, the 70s a big one. It is. Yeah. To be part of this iconic program. You've been here since honor. the beginning. Yes, right. Uh, in fact, I was here when they started building the studio. And I said, this Garraway guy, he's not bad. Yeah, when they started building the building. That's right. Yeah, that's what's impressive. All right, besides the 70th anniversary, the Olympics were a pretty big celebration here, of course, which meant we got to open up the plaza again to the crowds, to the guests, and, of course, our favorite, Ah, the yes. Food. Chefs were finally able to come back in person to cook for us, and you wouldn't believe just how much work goes into each short cooking segment. Take a look. So you gotta no. smell these. Can I smell them? Here at the Today Show, cooking segments only last oh, about three minutes long. Sir, I call it a chicken shake. Chicken shake. But the prep that goes into them can start weeks in advance. It's my job about ideally two or three weeks before the segment airs to connect with the chef, decide on recipes that would be good for the broadcast and that our viewers at home would be interested in making. Once the recipe is decided on, the segment producer passes it along to our culinary producer and food stylist, Katie Stillo. My job is to make culinary magic every single day. So from the recipe, we take that and we turn it into our food breakdown, which is where you write each individual step that the chef will be performing on live TV. It's Katie's job to shop for the ingredients and pull all of the necessary cooking equipment for each recipe. This room is full of endless amounts of bowls, plates, cookware, anything you could think of, we have it. Some of the food is prepped the day before, and the rest is cooked the morning of the segment. That's also where the collaboration with our set design team is on full display. Hi, I'm Ed Helding, production designer for the Today Show. Uh, my team does all the set design for food segments. Generally, they're sort of formulaic, but with bigger things like Super Bowl, we do a lot of decorations for the tables, some backgrounds, and just get to dress it up a little bit more. A little bit of soy sauce just Finally, it's time for this really segment to air. Yu is phonetically similar to a word that represents uh, prosperity and mm. abundance. So it's everything great. has meaning and everything has so much thought behind it. Sharing a meal together live feels so good. Whole fingers, more parts, you know, that type of thing. It reminds me of Chinese New Year when the family gets together and we're all together and hanging out next to the But the hardest part? <laughs> Putting the fork down and moving to the next segment. That is insane. Wow. This is amazing. We love getting to dig in and trying these amazing dishes. When we come back, we're going to dig in and answer some questions from our fans who joined us on the plaza. We'll be right back. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. 
My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. Allie Jackson now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Allie Jackson now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. Allie Jackson now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Welcome back. Now is part of the show where we answer some of your questions. This time we got fans out on our plaza, our Olympic plaza at the time, to participate. I'm about to graduate from college and I was wondering about your best advice on following your dreams. So what do you say? Your best advice on following your dreams. You know, it to be open. To, mm -hmm. to everything, you know? I wanted to be work in television. Mm -hmm. I want, didn't want to be on TV. Uh, and my department chairman put me up for a job in the sophomore year doing television weather, and I thought, oh, whatever. Mm -hmm. And it worked out okay, yeah, yeah. you know? Deborah, Deborah was a theater major. And, oh, and really? I didn't know that. that. Switched to journalism. I didn't know that. Well, I, I think that is yeah. such good advice, because, you know, especially I took the route where I went to the small markets, you know, but I had to leave home that first yeah moment where it's like, oh, I have to move on my own and live by myself in a city I've never been to before, Erie, Pennsylvania. But I'm glad I did it. Your your life in your 20s is in your full life, you know, right. so I know you're going to miss your friends. I know you're going to miss, you know, everything you're so used to, but you have to just take that chance to try something yep. and you can always come back. I want to know what's your favorite rom-com Okay, so your favorite rom com? I think we know yours. My best friend's wedding yes. in Notting Hill. Okay. I, I love Julia <laughs> Two. Roberts. Two. Yeah, I just love that. Julia Roberts. Uh -huh. and Notting Hill, and it's just funny. See, and I love like anything with Tom Hanks. So to me, you've got mail, uh -huh. almost the same as Sleepless in Seattle. Like, right. those are my That's favorite rom coms. I can uh, see that. I love Hitch. You know, uh, mm -hmm. it's just this is where you live. What was your first date like? First That's a date. fun question. My, I remember mine because, so Brian and I, if, if you follow us on Instagram, you know that like we can be socially awkward sometimes. So we went out for brunch and we met up and we're at a restaurant in Boston. Like all the tables are really close together, yeah. kind of like in New York City. So he had to kind of like scoot between the tables, but a girl had her purse there. So as he's getting to his seat, he steps in her purse oh. and he goes, would you look at that? My foot is in your purse. <laughs> And you laughed? And, it was, and I thought it was the funniest thing. I couldn't stop laughing. It was like the best way what, the to girl start thought? off a first date. She was in shock. She's oh. like, you know. But and he Uche. had you at hello. Uche and your... So ours was a little different because do you date when you're 17 and 19? I mean, you know. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So there was a restaurant called Yesterdays, and they would hand out these little $2 bucks, uh -huh. but you didn't have to max out. So if right. you got like $20 worth of these free bucks, right. you could go to dinner. So oh. we had free bucks, and we went to the... You pool. pulled your bucks? And the Simpsons were on behind my head. Oh. And I remember <laughs> him watching The Simpsons. Wow. He was and, riveted by you. Huh? And 15, 20 years later. He's still watching The Simpsons? If it's something behind my head, he might just look down. I'm just kidding. No! <laughs> what about you? What about you? Uh, we went to a restaurant. Uh, it just opened up here. It's been around forever now. But it's called Michael's. Okay. Uh, and it was kind of like this kind of great old school restaurant and just loved it. We have reservations there tomorrow night. There no you way. go. Tell them I said hi. I will. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, that was fun. That was okay. fun. All right. We're just about done with this special. But if you want more behind the scenes of today, sign up for Today Insider. You'll get a weekly email including early access to steals and deals, giveaways, and oh so much more. Just go to today.com slash insider. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you later. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Come back again.
First of all, I just want to comment that when you came rocking up here with your braids, I was in my head applauding <laughs> because I remember the story. Yes. You were at AT&T. It was one of your first big jobs. You had braids. Like, what did they tell you? Yes. They told me that my braids and my red shoes were unprofessional. Oh. And, I mean, they meant it. And they were trying to help. I mean, that's the part that, that's the irony of it all. They're really trying to help me. And they said, you have to get rid of that. So I went home, and my mom and my oldest sister, Cassandra, stayed up all night with me taking my braids out. Because you wanted to fit. Oh, I wanted to fit. You've been breaking the mold for most of your life. Yes. Uh, you've been someone who just makes your way through. But I want to go way, way back. Okay. Because I think we're all shaped from when we're little kids. Yes. And when you were a little kid, you were scared. Yes. I was scared. I was scared. Domestic violence uh, was part of, our, uh, part of our family. Where did you put that part of your life when you were a little girl? Uh, you know, we hid it. I mean, people didn't know that my mom was a, you know, a victim of domestic violence. They didn't know my dad was doing the things he was doing. And so we just hid it, just like they hid it, mm -hmm. uh, until it just got to a point where my mom decided she wasn't going to deal with it anymore. As a little girl, how did you feel when you couldn't protect her? It was tough. And there were six of us. I mean, so we'd get in each other's rooms or, you know, we'd sit on the couch and we'd hear things. And it, it got to a point where my brother was uh, getting ready to graduate from high school and I was 15. It got to the point where we had to call the police uh, hmm. because it was graduation day and um, he just went crazy. And we called the police and they came and got us. My mom says we have to go to the graduation. So we still did that. And then we went to Cassandra's house and stayed the whole summer. And that was it. Did he think that you could ever become somebody? No, and that was the painful part. He told my youngest sister and I that summer that we would be hookers on the street without him. Mm. And that was so painful. I mean, it was so painful, but there were years where I would think about that every single day, mm. that he actually said that. Mm. And that's when my younger sister cried, I cried, and I don't know where it came from. I was 15 years old. And she said, is that true? I said, that's not true. Hmm. Because I guess I just dug into like everything my mom had taught us, that we are not going to be hookers on the street. I said, I'm going to be the president of something one day. Now, this optimism, this, you have, I know who's on your side. Yes. God's on your side. Yes. And your mom has placed that on your heart since you were a little girl. Yes. Math book in this hand, Bible in this hand. Yeah. So did you always feel protected somehow? that God was going to watch out for you no yes. matter how bad things got. Yes, I always felt that. I mean, I always felt that. And my mom used to like take all six of us to church and we'd walk to church. And she'd walk us up Cutting Boulevard and then 23rd Street and she'd give us scriptures, the 23rd Psalm. She'd give us scriptures about protection. And so I just always felt that God was going to protect me. But I always felt that other people huh. would protect me too. So I always felt like somebody was going to show up. So here you are, you told your sister, we're going to be somebody, we're going to go to college. We're yes. going to, so you get into, where, where'd, you go to, where'd you go to college? The number one public institution in the world. It. The University of California at Berkeley. Yes, yes, yes. And not because it's such a great school, but because it was 15 minutes away from home. Yeah. So you were at Berkeley, you were the first black cheerleader. Yes. You were the first black member of a sorority. Uh, DG. Yes. Anchors uh -huh. away. <laughs> Anchors away. <laughs> did you set out to be the first or did you just do what you did? No, I just did what I did. And I think that happens a lot. Like, you don't know you're the first. I was a cheerleader in high school. So I said, okay, I'm going to be a cheerleader in college. And I went out for the first time and did not make it and said, well, that happened to me in high school too. And so I went out and I made it. And then, of course, uh, being in my sorority, I went through Rush and I ended up being a DG. And I didn't know that I was going to be, that I was on it black girl in the house yeah. until I got there. Yeah. As me and 110 of my white and Asian friends, it's like, <laughs> okay, great. And you know, everybody feeling on the Afro and all that. It was a great experience, a great, but you don't know your first, you're just doing, right. I was just doing what I was supposed to. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job 
is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Jackson now weekdays at 5 on NBC News now NBC News streaming free now so AT&T um, wait were you married when you went to AT&T no, no no I had this whole plan that I was going to graduate from college. you know once I put my boyfriend on hold for four years literally four years once I put him on hold then picked it back up I said okay so I'll, I'll get married two years I am going to work for two years then I'm going to have, you know, start a family. So I had it kind of all mapped out. I would have thought that you had all the tough stuff in your life early. But I would, if, if I were God, I would say, Sint does not deserve any more tough stuff right. after what she's been through. But life is funny like that. <laughs> yes, it is. It doesn't give you all the goodness later. The no. bad stuff still comes. You and your husband right. really did want to start a family, didn't we did. you? We did. And that was not to be early, was it? No. Four second trimester miscarriages. Mm in 10 years of trying to have kids, mm. four. We never could quite figure it out. And then when we got pregnant the fifth time, I said, okay, this is the fifth and final time. This is it. And we just thought there was either another miscarriage coming or a full-term pregnancy. Mm. We didn't know there was something in the middle mm. where we ended up having a premature daughter who lived for six months, so she defied the odds. They thought it would be two days. So special K, it was Carolyn with the K. My mom's name is Carolyn. Mm -hmm. So Carolyn with a K, Special K's uh, doctor at her funeral, he eulogized her and he said, Carolyn Marshall was here to teach us that we're not God. Mm. He said all the things we thought that would take her out and all that, they didn't. And you said she did have a purpose. There oh, was totally. obviously a clear purpose. But children, um, you wanted children, you and your husband. Yes. So you went down a beautiful road, uh, yes. the road of adoption. Yes. I mean, it's so beautiful. made for you, don't you think? Your kids were made for you. Yes, but I remember telling, it was after my fourth miscarriage, and I remember telling a colleague at work when he, he said, Sent, we have some friends who adopted, and maybe you should think about doing that. Because at this point, everybody's concerned. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I'm going through all these uh, surgeries and blood transfusions and near-death experiences, and so my friends really stepped in and family and said, maybe you guys should adopt. And I remember telling this guy, Tom Villa, I remember saying, Tom, are you nuts? And I can't even believe I told him this, so I'm gonna confess, yeah, right? Yeah. I can't believe I told him this. I said, there is no way you can love kids that somebody else had as if they were your own. Uh -huh. That is impossible. Yeah. I am going to have this kid. Yeah. Oh, I was, you know, I was still adamant. grieving. I was cutting grieving, up. Grieving, sure. I was cutting up on that staircase. I mean, I can still see it. And he just looked at me and he said, Sen, I'm telling you, our friends don't see a difference. I said, they do, and they're just not telling you about mm -hmm. it. So then later, when we adopted our first, okay, and I sent out pictures, Christmas cards, and it was a picture with the judge and our new son, mm. Kenneth Anthony, and he's two years old, two and a half years old. And the caption said, you know, happy holidays, Anthony adopted us. And we're all just smiling, so my buddy Tom calls. So this is years later. He said, uh, tell me that again. He said, what's that? So he had a bad word. What's that mm, yeah. you told me? He said, uh, you can't love people's kids. I said, my boy, just hang up my phone. Hang up my phone. Because obviously he was right and I was wrong. But you said that your oh. son adopted you. Yes. That's yes. what happened. And he adopted us. He stole our hearts from day wow. one. Little bitty something, literally suffering from failure to thrive. Had been abandoned, neglected, born in a bathtub. Abandoned when he was nine months old. Mm. With his nine-year-old brother taking care of him for two months. Did... um. Your family grew over the years, yes. and that was such a beautiful part of your life. But back to the business side. So AT&T, and we talked about this, it yes. tell you to take your braids down. You do exactly what they say. Right. When you got promotions, did you expect them? Because I'm sure you got no. plenty. No, never, never. I never in my 36 years sought a promotion, never. Really? I was just so, you know, I'm a kid from the projects. 
I was just so happy to have the job that I had and make the money I was making and things were great and I got a chance to lead and touch people, which is what I'm all about. And so every job I ever had, I loved it. So you are 40 years old. Yes. And you get the call that any person working at a company for a long time would want. Uh, a huge promotion. Huge. 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 Officer. Yeah. So except for there were a couple of strings attached. Uh, just a few. Yeah. OK, so I walk in, and I'm, I walk in at home. And so I'll, the call came in in the evening. And so my husband's sitting there, so he's hearing this call. And my boss tells me that um, the board had just approved me being an officer of the business. And congratulations. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, wow. And so she says, but a uh, few things. She says, I don't want you, you know, you're going to have to tone it down a little bit. I don't want you to laugh so loud. I mean, you're a happy person. You're, you know, you laugh loud. I can hear it up the hallway, so you're going to have to, you know, pull that back. And I'm like, mm, I'm not liking this call, right? And she says, and then uh, I want you to cut your hair. I left a magazine on your desk. And these people, they're black people, they're all in white, some event. And the lady has short hair, so I think you'd look good with that. Um, and then she said, uh, you can't be called Cent. Nobody really knows what that is. So it's Cynthia or Cindy. And at this point, I'm like, okay, this is getting kind of crazy. And then she said, and you cannot use the word blessed. I've heard you say that a few times. You just need to say lucky. Mm. And I said, you know what? I, I don't think I'm lucky. I'm blessed. And so now it sounds like you're trying to fundamentally change who I am. Mm -hmm. And then she said she didn't want all the people in my office. I had to get distant from the people. I'm like, this is going too far. And bottom line is, I, I turned down the job. Wait, you and turned I, it down? Yes, I did. You turned down the money yes. and the job. I said, you know what? I need you to help me figure out how to say no, because I don't want to offend anybody. I mean, this is big, and I know it's big. I don't want to offend anybody, and I don't want to lose my job, Right. OK? Because I'm not accepting this other job, so help me figure out how to say right. no. And she says, you're right. I don't think you fit the profile. And basically, she was saying she didn't think I was sophisticated enough. And so she says, I'll help you. So my husband's in the background. He's like, you can go to my barber. OK, I got somebody that can cut your hair. You look good in white. Because he's hearing me with all this. I'm like, stop. Right. He's like, take the job. Take, take the, the job. job. Yeah. We can figure all this out later. And I said, you know, when I first started, y'all made me take out, get rid of my red shoes and take down my braids. Like, wh when does this stop? <laughs> At some point, like, I have to be able to be me. And now you want to change my name? I've been sent my whole life. No. And so then I got a call from two, I got two calls from two bosses, her bosses. And they started off the call with sent and they put <laughs> emphasis on it. And I said, yes. And they both said they knew what had happened and they wanted to start all over. And I'll never forget uh, someone telling me, he said, the person that we promoted to be an officer is the person who we want to walk in the door tomorrow. Mm -hmm. He says, and I've been to your office there in San Francisco, and I see your big sign that says, Lord, there's nothing that can happen today that you and I can't handle. I've seen this. And so he goes on to tell me about me mm -hmm. and what he loves about me. Mm. And that's the person God. who they want to be an officer and who better show up to work tomorrow. And he apologized. That was so powerful. The words of a leader are powerful. Do you know how many women struggle with this, exactly what you're saying? Yes. Because we are always put in boxes with what to wear, yes. how to be how to act. Exactly. And exactly. to be able to have a voice like you did. Right. It was beautiful. You were at one point, and this is such a beautiful image, you were ringing the bell on Wall Street. Oh. You were, you, at Wall Street, ringing the bell. And that image is powerful, but what's more mm. powerful is all your history came washing back. It did. It did. We were outside. So, you know, we had our event with the union that morning and all that. It was, I think, the 30 year anniversary of us on Wall Street, uh, AT&T. And I'm standing on the corner and I look up and I actually see it's Wall Street and another street. And I just started crying. Mm. And our CFO, John Stevens, is standing there and he goes, Sent, what's wrong? And I said, you know, my daddy told us that we were going to be hookers on the street. And I told my mom, I'm going to make money, my money on Wall Street. I'm on Wall Street. This is crazy. So he gives me his, his phone and I called my mom. Oh. And she just started crying. I said, guess where I am? I said, I'm on Wall Street. And guess what I'm doing today? And she just started crying. It's like, it happened. Oh, my God. NBC News, streaming free. Now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? 
What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Prince. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Prince. NBC News, streaming free now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Prince. Hallie Jackson now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. So you have this illustrious career at AT&T and all of a sudden you're retired. You're like, you know what? You worked hard. You I'm deserve chilling. you deserve to chill. <laughs> and then some guy named Mark Cuban from the Mavericks is like, what? I'm the, look, you need to help us. Right. And you're right. like, who are you, Mark? Who, who are you? <laughs> I mean, honestly, he was, uh, he, he, Mark and his chief of staff, they were blowing up my cell phone. So I handed my husband the phone and said, because I didn't look at it. And he came back and he said, um, this guy doesn't need any money. Uh, you need to call him. It's Mark Cuban. And I said, who? I had to ask him, because I yeah. honestly, I didn't know Mark Cuban. And so he told me who it was, and I said, okay, I'll call him. And he goes, no. You need to have that. You need to call him right now. Right now. Like, and then when I called him, it was beautiful. He wanted to know if he could see me that afternoon. Wanted to know if I had been watching the news that he was having a crisis. Kind of explain what was going on with the Sports Illustrated article coming out and all that. And he was so genuinely disturbed about I mean, what was going this on. This is an organization that was really troubled. I mean, troubled. it was smack dab in the middle of a misogynistic culture, yes. um, sexual abuse allegations, all of the worst of the worst. Right. I mean, you, you're being asked to come in there and clean up the house, basically. Right, right. How, how, how are you going to do that? And at first I'm thinking, I'm not going to do this. Yeah. Okay, and so I go and I talk to him. And so then once I talk to him, I just thought, hmm, I got to go home and pray about this. And that's what I told him. I said, I don't know if I'm going to do this. And two women stopped me on the way, two women stopped me on the way out of his office and said, are you the person who Mark Cuban said is going to come in and help us and save us? And I said, well, I don't have the power to save anybody, but I know who does. I said, I don't really know yet. And then they said, well, can we talk to you? And they talked to me and they told me their stories. And I spent time with those women standing right outside of Mark's office. And he wanted me to talk to him. He just kind of nodded, like, talk to them. I mean, whatever you can get, whatever you can hear. And so they were just telling me about the culture oh. and how women were being treated and a couple of things that had actually happened to them that they felt were inappropriate. Mm. And they said, we, we need help. You, you have yeah. to come in. The stuff in the article is true. I said, I, I told him I'm going to pray about it. And at this mm -hmm. point, I'm thinking, OK, mm -hmm. maybe I am uniquely qualified to help. Mm -hmm. OK. And so they started telling me what they need. And oh, my goodness. So I went home and I prayed about it. I came back the next day. And, said, and I, was in the, I was in the office for three hours before Mark even knew I was in the building because I never made it to his office. People mm. pulled me in a conference room and just started talking to me, wow. men and women, about the workplace. And it just wasn't all just misconduct, now, sexual harassment. Oh, it was a lot of other stuff too, like? Yeah, just uh, performance yeah. issues, favoritism. I mean, yeah. just. But you had to go in one woman and change it. How did you go about it? I laid out a vision uh, from day one that said we would set the global standard in the NBA for diversity and inclusion, mm -hmm. because I truly believe that that's where you start. And then I laid out a set of values, the spell crafts, character, respect, authenticity, mm -hmm. fairness, teamwork, and safety, mm -hmm. both physical and emotional safety, and said these will not just be on the walls, but they would operate in the halls. Mm -hmm. Everything we will do 
Every decision we make, every hire we make, it will be based on this set of values. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you what that looks like. And so I went through mm -hmm. each one of them, laid out a 100-day plan that had four parts to it, model zero tolerance, so meaning hotline, mm -hmm. investigation, terminations if mm -hmm. necessary, and, and there were some right. that were, they were necessary, uh, a, a MAVS women's agenda, so really an agenda to educate, elevate, and empower women, because that was missing. Yeah. Uh, and then just cultural transformation around diversity, equity, and inclusion, all that. And then operational effectiveness, just basic things like how you pay people, gender pay equity, all that. And it was about 200 initiatives. We laid it out and said, let's go. And so when the investigators report came out with the, uh, the 13 things they wanted us mm -hmm. to do, and we had already done just about all of them, uh, he had a press conference. Uh, and he talked about those 13 things yeah, and the expectations. Well. And I believe that press conference was really sending a message mm -hmm. to all of the teams, to the entire league. Here is what we are about and here's what we're not about. And it's slow, it's, it's slow progress. Slow. Yeah, it's how slow much progress. work is there to do, would you say? Oh, we're not done yet. Yeah. There's a lot of work to do. You have been at the helm of the Mavericks during a time in history that kids are going to be reading about for a long, long time. This is a social justice reckoning is happening, George Floyd, all these, these things are happening and you're kind of at the forefront. How has it been navigating these waters? It's been interesting because I, I call it a double pandemic. And what I told our team is that even when, when the NBA shut down, uh, I remember sitting in a conference room the next day after we sent our people home um, and I said, we don't know how long we're not going to be playing basketball, but we're going to be playing the game of life with people. And so what does that look like? Who do we need to help? How do we step up? And I actually ended up coining a phrase called my new dot com because as a leader, different things were important to me now. Having compassion for people, communication had to be done very uh, differently. Community service was at an all time high. We have an opportunity to impact that compromise. Mm -hmm. And that really came out with the George mm -hmm. Floyd situation. And then compliance. It's like we have things that we have to do like wash our hands, wear a mask, keep our distance early on, okay? And so those are the things we really start to focus on. And so as soon as we really start to focus on that, because we did a lot with the Mavericks for community service, I mean, a lot. We were out there everywhere trying to help essential workers, even essential workers that needed daycare, meals at the hospital. I mean, you name it, we were there. We did, yeah. Virtual, I mean, technology for kids, all that. And then here comes the George Floyd mm -hmm. murder. Mm -hmm. And we stepped up and we just decided, you know, my boss was having conversations with folks. I was having conversations, what we call true courageous conversations. Mm. And so we decided to have a big community conversation for Dallas. And we brought 200 community leaders together. Mm. And I said, I want people who represent the systems that undergird systemic racism in this country. Mm. And our theme was listen, learn, unite. Mm. And so we had a big conversation June 9th Wow. of last year, it was beautiful. And we said, well, what are we gonna unite around? Because we need to take action. Mm -hmm. And so we developed something called MAVS Take Action. And it's advocacy, communication, training, investment, outreach yeah. and noise. And the yeah. investment is around community investment, economic investment, employment, uh, and just all of that, right? Mm -hmm. And so it was 50 initiatives where we said, we are going to have a minimum 10,000 volunteer hours and $5 million minimum that we're going to put into making sure that we promote social justice, mm -hmm. we eradicate these racial disparities that exist in all of these different systems right. across healthcare, education, sure. uh, economics, I mean, all that, right? And mm -hmm. we said we want to drive sustainable change. We mm -hmm. want it to last. Mm -hmm. And so we've been doing all kinds of things around that. Uh, even in our arena, I mean, we've had you know, situations where just very few people Mm -hmm. didn't like the stand we were taking. They didn't yeah. like the fact that our players were playing on a court in the bubble that said Black Lives Matter and mm -hmm. all that. Mm -hmm. The beautiful thing is I wanted to talk to all of these people. I said, anybody who leaves us, I want to talk to them. Mm. They can leave. I mean, we'll, we'll get other right. customers. Let's mm -hmm. listen to each other, mm -hmm. learn from each other. We probably have more in common than differences every now and then. Mm -hmm. You find that's not the case, but usually it's the case. Sure. And nine out of 10 times, the customer would not leave. Nine out of 10 times they wouldn't leave. We need to talk mm. because we do have some real issues in this country. Yeah, and sure we have do. to respond to those real issues. And what I love about our team, what I love about the NBA is we have the platform. Yeah. 
We normally bring yep. people together. We bring people mm -hmm. together all the time. Our arena, we have 41, what I call 41 parties. Right, right, 19,200 right. yeah. people at every party. Yeah, yeah. And so we bring them together. Right. And so people expect us right. to unify people. Right. So why not unify them around these critical issues? Right. So that's what we've been doing. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. Do you think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Do you think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. Um, I look at you and I, it's hard to believe that you are a cancer survivor. I don't Ooh. know why I'm saying that, but because you are lit from inside and you don't have, um, you know, as a cancer survivor myself, sometimes yes. I think about it, sometimes I don't. How bad was it for you? It was bad. I mean, I thought I had months to live. It was bad. When the doctor says, I got bad news, sit down. I mean, it's bad and significant. And then he tells me that I have stage three colon cancer, one lymph node away from stage four. And so I went through brutal chemotherapy for six months. It was how brutal. old were you and how old were your kids? I was, uh, I got that call. I talked to him. I got my colonoscopy the day before my 51st birthday. So my last day of 50. So technically I was in compliance of get a colonoscopy mm -hmm, at 50. By 50. And so, and the kids, my, my son was a freshman in college. Mm. Uh, Ricky was a little older. Uh, the girls were still in high school, middle school, so it was How crazy. And so we had to tell them. My husband didn't want to tell them. Yeah. And I said, we have to tell them because I, I need these honeys. I need them to be my prayer warriors. Mm -hmm. And, and I, that's, what, that's what I told them. I said, I, I need you to, to, to be in here with us. And they all responded very, very differently. My daughter Shirley just said, I know you're going to die. I've seen the movie mm. Stepmom. Mm. You're going to die and you're not telling us. And Oh, uh, it, was, it was just brutal. Yeah. It was brutal. In fact, one time Shirley told me, she goes, Mom, you're going to die. You're going to die. I said, why do you think that? She says, because you don't have your clothes on the door the night before. You don't put them on to go to work. And you don't come in at nighttime. She had a routine. It got to the point, Hoda, where I literally started hanging my clothes up on the door. I told my husband, I got to go in the office just so Shirley can be okay. Mm. And so one time I went in the office. I stayed in there. I fell asleep. I came home late, I walked in, I was so sick. Shirley was on cloud nine. She said, mommy's gonna live, mommy's gonna oh live. I said, Shirley, why did you say that? She said, it's nighttime. You came home at nighttime and look what you have on, the clothes are on the door. You don't even realize okay, these kids that's... are, you don't realize these kids are in a routine. They're in a routine. Right. And she needed her routine back. And so then I had to just try to get the strength even after mm a bad round of chemo, because I'd have nine bad days and five good days. Right. And usually what I try to do is go in the office and do everything in those right. five good days. But I said, I got to try to fake my way through some of these yeah. nine days, just yeah. for the kids. Just wow. for the kids. Um, you're so fascinating. <laughs> when is the movie coming out? Um. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm writing a book about my cancer journey. I'm finally writing a book about it. When you look at all the things that you've overcome, what was the, which, if you had to, like put them in order, what would be the most difficult thing you think you ha that, that you had to overcome in your life of all of these things? I would say letting go of what I thought was my plan, mm. that I had this plan of I was going to have a family, what mm -hmm. it was going to look like, all that, and having that be truly one of the first times in my life where it just didn't go according right, just like you thought. to my plan. Right. And I had to let it go 
and just realized that there was a plan operating bigger than my plan. Mm -hmm. And I have proof that it all turned out. Well, hello there, everybody, and thanks for tuning in to a Tuesday Pop Star Plus. Today on the show, one of the stars of a miniseries that has a lot of people talking, Inventing Anna's Anna Klumski is here to tell us why she thinks the story about a real-life con woman is so captivating to viewers. Plus, Bob Odenkirk on the ups and downs of his career in an exclusive conversation on his brand new memoir. And a clip from The Vault featuring Oscar winner Javier Bardem. But first, here's today's pop star. Lots to get to in pop star today. Savannah, is it Rami and Michelle's wedding? Or <laughs> Romy, Romy, Romy. Well, I might butcher this one too. First up, Fantastic Beast, The Secrets of Dumbledore. Break out your wands, everybody. On Monday, Warner Brothers dropped a new trailer for the third chapter in the Harry Potter prequel series. The new preview teasing fans with a big return to Hogwarts as Jude Law steps back into the role of young Dumbledore and prepares to face off with one of the wizarding world's most infamous villains. I'm sorry to disturb you, Albus, but I've just received troubling news. Tell me, what is it? It's Grindelwald. The time is closed, my brothers and sisters. Our war with the Muggles begins today! The world as we know it is coming undone. If we're to defeat him, you'll have to trust me. All right, Fantastic Beast, this Beast, The Secrets of Dumbledore, hits theaters April 15th. Oh, thank God that's done. Next up, Dwayne Johnson, The Rock Never Fails to Tug at Our Heartstrings with this thoughtful post on social media and a new video. He's sharing a special moment from a visit to his grandparents' gravesite with his mom in Hawaii. I mean, Daddy, this is for you. And for all of you out there who's lost someone, this is for you. Oh, that's nice of you, huh? means go for a walk. Johnson adding in the caption, life moves so fast, mm -hmm. how important it is to just slow down, sit here, reminisce and listen to her sing, play her ukulele and tell all her stories. Some wise words from Sweet. The Rock there. Sweet. Next up, Michael Douglas, the Oscar winning is Amy, winner is aiming to catch lightning in a bottle with his next big role. Douglas set to star as Benjamin Franklin in a new show that's headed to Apple TV Plus. The limited series is going to be set in the later years of Franklin's career, around the time he engineered America's alliance with France and peace with England. That'd be between 1778 and 1783, if my <laughs> memory that. recalls. Well well is it Romy or Romy? It's weird the things you remember. <laughs> Douglas will also produce the project based on Stacey Schiff's book, A Great Improvisation, Franklin, France, and the Birth of America. No word yet on when that show's scheduled to premiere, but it does look good already. Mm -hmm. All right, finally, the first First day of the month can only mean what? one thing. <laughs> Jenna Bush Hager is here with a new book. Yes, <laughs> there I go. am. And I'm so happy to be a correspondent on Pop Star. Let's do it. Are y'all ready? Yes. yes. We have a countdown, I think. Are we counting down on the plaza? I hope so. Three, if not, three, three two, two, one. It is Groundskeeping by Lee Oh, thank Cole. God it's that one. It is there a they beautiful, are. beautiful novel about an inspiring writer who takes classes at a local Woo! college and becomes the groundskeeper. He falls madly in love with a girl named Alma who is very different. It takes place in 2016, oh. but it's about family, unconditional love, and what binds us. Y'all, mm -hmm. in a time where everybody's so divided, yeah. we need this but book. Groundskeeping. Yes. Okay. It. You can head to today.com yes. slash read with Jenna or use that QR code for more information. Join the book club. There's not only a book club, it's a whole conversation. Then you can buy the book or mm -hmm. be like me and wait till the movie comes out. <laughs> do that yeah. but you know what else you can do you can what? join us tomorrow live on our plaza we're going to celebrate the third anniversary three oh. years i've turned three oh of my gosh Jenna, i know also, because oh. there's 35 books i still got to read for the past three years of <laughs> <laughs> Jenna. we have Nancy a lot reads know, yes, yes, does, and also reads. it may be nancy's favorite day it's read across america day yeah. so we're gonna have a really oh, cool story oh, way to go jenna way to go and now the reason we call the show Pop Star Plus, a few more headlines for you, and we'll start with Euphoria. The Zendaya-led series is making its way into HBO history. Sunday's season two finale was the network's second most watched show since 2004. The grungy high school mega hit coming in second only to 
That's right, the mega hit Game of Thrones. Of course, you can believe it. It's already been three years since Game of Thrones wrapped up that show's finale, and it scored a whopping 19.3 million viewers. A good sign for the upcoming spinoff, House of the Dragon, which is scheduled to premiere later this year. Finally, America's Got Talent Extreme in last night's episode of the AGT spinoff, a 90-year-old grandmother stunned judges when she came out to perform a fiery stunt with her 24-year-old grandson. Lillian held on tight to Hunter as the pair rode through, count them, five walls of fire. There's the extreme part of AGT Extreme. No surprise, all three judges gave Lillian and Hunter a big yes. And that's going to do it for your Popstar Plus headlines. But we got a lot more coming up. Anna Klumski is going to give us a glimpse into her new miniseries that a lot of people are talking about. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free. Now. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to Popstar Plus. You might know Anna Klumski from her Emmy-nominated role on Veep or the beloved 90s movie My Girl. Well, lately she's starring in Inventing Anna, a new miniseries about Anna Delvey, a real-life heiress who stole money from New York elites. Klumski plays a journalist investigating Delvey's story, and she told us what she hopes viewers take away from the show. I think Anna Delvey... I didn't know anything, and uh, and it was really fun when I like told younger people, like my brother or something, that uh, you know I'm going to do this show about this young woman who who conned a lot of people, and then you know my brother's like <gasps> Anna Delvey, like he was like so excited, and yeah, so I uh, I got to come to it this way. I might have a story. Her name is Anna Delvey. Or Anna Sorokin, no one's sure. She's either a rich German heiress or she's flat broke. The charges are insane. You know, Shonda was interested in a lot more than just adapting a salacious, you know, kind of rich people story, right? Like she was interested in so much more about, about how people treat each other, how people deal with each other. Who, who's privy to whose information? You know, um, why? What are the sanctions for? Are the sanctions correct? Um, do they need to be adjusted? Um, you know, how, how far can you get into somebody's life without harm being done? You know, the, all of these things. She is everything that is wrong with America right now. I am famous. I mean, I know why our telling of it captivates me, but I, it's it's honestly still a question I have of what about her actual story has has lasted this, you know, already. Like, it, it, it's got legs and people still care about it. And I think that's wonderful, obviously, selfishly, I think it's wonderful. Um, but it is sort of surprising. But yeah, like, we're living the actual phenomenon of her gripping personality. You know, she definitely does remind you of those, of the types of people that that do kind of just grip 
on um, on the people that they meet and they just make them want to please them. And so I think that society is doing that in a weird way. And I'm part of it. Millions of dollars. Hi, Anna. I just had some questions. I have a question. What's you wearing? You look poor. It's something I really I, I connected to with playing Vivian was that she just really, really loves her craft. She loves the craft of journalism the way that I love the craft of acting. I mean, I think on the very surface, she and I both are really, really fast mental processing. You know, like we're, we've just got a ton of information and we're, and it's all, it's all game. So Jessica is um, is one of our co-producers. So she's she's given our blessing all the way um, from the get-go. And I, like we, you know, we, we didn't have like lunches. You know, we didn't do that sort of thing because I I actually was tasked with not matching. I'm not matching her. Some of our our cast members um, had that assignment to you know to be playing a real person that is is known and and um, and to match them. And, and mine, we were fictionalizing. Um, so we're very, very inspired, obviously. We're, the article's the article. But because the article is the thing that we were keeping most closely matched, that is sort of what I went with. I went with all of the written word that I could. I read all of Jessica's articles. I read all of her notes. Um, she's, she, she's a copious note taker, and I and thank you. <laughs> um, you know, especially as we were discussing for, discussing for such a cerebral um, character, it almost feels like the written word you're gonna you're you're gonna unlock a lot more through their voice um, uh, on the page, and um, and I just felt like it was that that was my way in. It, it was it was like a I don't know it was like a decoding um, the written word, and I loved that. It helped me with with all my choices. I think Anna Delby, you know, is up to her, and uh, yeah, I think I think she's. I think she's impossible to know. Um, I've never met her personally, so I'm not going to really get into who she is, but you know, I, again, another question, how much can you ever know a person, right? Is, your, is the way you see green the way I see green? None of us are gonna know, like ever. <laughs> so yeah, um, and you know, it's, it's, it's for her to know and it's for other people to, um, to determine how much it matters to them. I hope that people, it's like the slow burn that I always hope for after a show, you know? I, I really hope that, you know, as they walk around in their own lives, making their own choices, they they have another platform upon which to, to decide, um, you know, what they think is good and bad, what they think is right and wrong, what is okay with them about the way people treat other people. You know, I feel like we present so many great and important and relevant questions about today's, we use the word society so much, but it's true, um, you know, about today's society that I think that, you know, an audience member would be remiss uh, to not adopt some of those questions themselves. You know, so that's, that's I just hope that they, they come, you know, come out of it with, with, with some, some personal debate. It's good. It's good. We should mention you can catch Inventing Anna right now, streaming on Netflix. Next up, a visit with the great Bob Odenkirk. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Prince. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free. Now. 
Allie Jackson now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. NBC News, streaming free now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. And we're back on Popstar Plus. Bob Odenkirk is unmistakable for his roles, of course, in Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. Now in the new memoir, comedy, 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 drama, he put pen to paper about his own career in showbiz. And he told us all about it today in Studio 1A. and comedian Bob Odenkirk is one of Hollywood's most beloved stars. He's a four-time Emmy nominee for his starring role in Better Call Saul and shined on the beloved Breaking Bad, and now he's sharing his story. It's a new memoir. Comedy, 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 drama. Bob, good morning, good morning. How are hey, you? Hey, I'm good. I'm just, Thank happy you so you're, I'm just happy you're here in this chair. That's so nice of you to say. We were talking I, about how you had, you call it a heart incident. Well, I want to just speak about it properly. Yeah. Heart doctors tell me that what I had was a heart incident, not technically a heart attack, but I don't know what the difference is. <laughs> my, I was turning blue and not breathing, and my, uh, my heart was arrhythmic. And it needed to get back to a rhythm. Where I don't really understand how it works, but I just know that I wouldn't have survived. if. Where um, did it happen? And how I was in the studio of Shooting Better Call Saul, our final season, yeah. which is going to premiere on April 18th. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be great if you're a Better Call Saul fan. Yeah. I can't wait for you to see this. But we were shooting a great scene, me and Ray Seahorn and Patrick Fabian and some other people. Yeah. And uh, we had gone off to our waiting area, yeah. and luckily I stayed in the area with the other actors, because if I'd gone to my trailer, I wouldn't be here right oh now. Oh my God. So I went down and they uh, set up the alarm and, and people came out, and uh, Rosa Estrada, our health officer, was a, a medic who served in the armed forces for a tour, and she came out and started CPR on me and saved my life. Did some people have epiphanies after something like that? I'm having a very slow epiphany, yeah. even right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the epiphany was simply that my life is pretty damn great. How great and I should that. appreciate it and the people around oh. me. Um, honestly, that's, you know, I think people do have epiphanies when they have a near-death experience. Um, and oftentimes it's, I have to change something, you know. And I think my epiphany is I have to appreciate what I have because hmm. it's really great. And I've got great people around me. And um, for some reason, people are very <laughs> nice to me well, and, and were so nice on social media when I had this heart, at well, heart attack. Well, Bob, um, this book is filled with all of that appreciation. But what you found I love is a lot of what you appreciate your life or maybe the things that didn't happen the way you mm -hmm. wanted to. Yeah. You were talking about once where you were, you were, you were trying for that Steve Carell job at the office and you yeah. wrote, um, one trick to surviving Hollywood's beat down is to keep making new things in spite of every no. Yeah. To somehow stay in touch with the joy that brought you to the game. It can be hard to do when you're, there's me and Chris Farley backsta yeah. backstage in Second City. That's me and Robert Smigel, yeah. a great writer of sketches. And uh, my oh, my agent, Ari Emanuel, so now how, world beater, no. amazing guy. So how did and, you pick yourself up when there was a when there was a swing and a miss like that? You know, I always had a weird faith in this business that if you came to it with a fresh idea, that you you'd get a, a hearing, a chance, mm. and it's really true. I mean, showbiz loves new faces and reinvented, you know, characters and faces. So I uh, I think it's just been a great business, and I just believed I, even in the hardest moments, the sense that I had something to offer if I just was patient and 
set to writing, which is how I started as a writer. Well, as a writer on SNL, you wrote one of the most famous sketches, uh, Living in a Van Down by the River, the Chris Farley sketch. Motivational speaker, yeah. That was that was to die for. It's one of those that lives on yeah, and on and on. Um, just real It's one quick. of my favorite things I ever did in show business. Really? My daughter asked me once, what's your favorite thing you've done? And I said it was doing this sketch at Second City every night for us the summer that I was there. And I wrote it for Chris. and. He wouldn't quit until he made every <laughs> performer laugh. You can see him making yeah, I can see. Uh, one by one. They're Christine dropping. Applegate and David Spade laugh. He wouldn't yeah. quit. He yeah. would just keep doing the character right in your face until you broke up. Are you happy you made the turn to drama? Um, I didn't even realize it was happening, man. All of a sudden, I'm in this drama stuff, and people are liking it. Um, yeah, it's great. Um, you know, you dig deeper into a character, and I've had such wonderful writing mm -hmm. with uh, the writers of Breaking Bad and now Better Call Saul. I've been very blessed. You are such a nice guy, Bob. Oh, I'm so nice happy. I, I hope people read this book. It's called Comedy, 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 Drama. It's full of not just stories about the business, but also stories about your life, and I think yeah. a lot of people are going to enjoy them. And also, if you're starting out in the business and you're wondering, can I take a crack at this? Yeah. This book is definitely for you. You can find more of it at today.com. Love Bob Odenkirk. Mr. Show, one of my favorite shows to this day. Bob Odenkirk's new memoir is available now. And coming up, we're dedicating our From the Vault segment to Oscar winner, Javier Bardem. NBC News, streaming free now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Hallie Jackson now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to Popstar Plus. Javier Bardem earned another Oscar nomination this year, his fourth, if you're keeping track at home, this time for his portrayal of Ricky Ricardo in Being the Ricardos. Of course, he won the Academy Award for his performance as a psychopath assassin in No Country for Old Men. What a movie that was back in 2008. Well, he spoke to today about that part. Here is today's From the Vault. The Coen brothers have a new thriller out. It is called No Country for Old Men, and it has taken home two Golden Globes. The movie is set in 1980s West Texas. It's the chilling tale of three lives that intersect. When one makes a life-changing discovery worth millions, another hunts him down to get it back, and the third tries to set it all right. Academy Award-nominated actor Javier Bardem stars in No Country for Old Men. Good morning to you. Good morning. You know, like a lot of the characters you run into in this movie, your character runs into, I was blown away. <laughs> Literally, by the movie, by the acting, by everything about it. By the way, congratulations on the Golden Globe, Thank Best you very Supporting much. Actor. I was sorry you didn't get to walk down the red carpet. Was that sort of a bummer? Um, uh, honestly, yeah, no, honestly, not because you, really? you don't have to get dressed and do the carpet. You guys are in the sofa on the coach. Um, Having a drink and so relax. you're sitting in your underwear <laughs> watching it essentially. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't know if I will be on my underwear, but I <laughs> definitely was watching it on TV. Yeah, well, so many people <laughs> thought you would get that nod. So were you surprised or just? Uh, I'm, I'm quite surprised about everything. I, I have to say, since the very first moment I did the movie, having in mind that I'm a Spanish actor doing a movie with the Coen Brothers, that's quite a surprise. So. Everything beyond that is kind of a gift for me. I think it's 
extraordinary the impact that the movie you know, Country for All Men has had in people, has in people, why and will have in people. Why do you think it's had that impact? I don't know, I think it's about the coins, about their work, about their talent, about how they are able to put together such a big masterpiece of a book by Cormac McCarthy and and put it out there in a very uh, beautifully constructed way, but also easy, easy to for everybody, but at the same time profound in, in the way that uh, there's a big statement behind the movie that makes the movie more powerful. Is uh, is beyond entertainment. It's something that is it has its own weight. You know, you talk about the effort of the Coen brothers, but you yourself, you had to create this character, Shigur, and you had little to go on. Mm -hmm. In the book, about all you know is that the guy has blue eyes, which mm -hmm. you don't I have, don't have and yet you create this this very menacing mm -hmm. presence with the gate and the toying costing and obviously the killing. How do you even go about creating Shigur? What, what was the process like for you? Um, I guess it's about really trying to bring what he represents, which is kind of the symbolic idea of violence, into a human behavior, which unfortunately we know, we are aware of that in a lot of behaviors out there. Uh, we, we are part of the violence and we have violence inside. Whatever we like it or not, we have to face it and we have to uh, really control it. Uh, he can't and that's the way you have to more or less understand where he's coming from, what he wants, and try to put it out there and create this character that is just that, a violent machine. But was it hard to inhabit that character? Because just to watch you mm -hmm. is difficult. I don't know, I, I don't think it was especially hard. Uh, it was very hard to wear that haircut, <laughs> but it's not very, really hard to be him just because it's just fiction. It's not something that you take with you when you get back to the hotel. Yeah, tell me about the haircut because a lot of thought went into that. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a very good idea of the coins. They did it, they, that's, uh, it came from them, and I think it's very helpful because make the whole character totally insane because it goes so against what he represents, this beautiful um, Prince Valiant kind of haircut that uh, it's totally, I don't know, uh, opposite what, of what it should be. Now, after you play a role like this, do you want to just do a something light-hearted, mm -hmm. silly? Uh, well, yeah, maybe. I don't. Know. I don't think in that terms. I just think about what the quality of the role is, and if I mean, I mean, I don't want to kill anybody else in the next <laughs> I'm glad couple of years <laughs> in movies. I mean, so, no, I sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it's a pleasure to meet you. Thank Congratulations. You. Good luck with the Oscar nomination. Something tells me we'll be hearing your name a lot more <laughs> in the weeks and months ahead. Thank you. And guess what? It just so happens to be Javier Bardem's birthday today. So, Javier, happy birthday to you out there. Another pop star plus in the books. Tomorrow we've got one of the stars of the Gilded Age. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome to Today All Day. All day? Today all day. All day. This is a long oh, way of man. asking yeah, who's your okay. favorite character you've ever all played. The right. unicorn. The unicorn. You gotta have the unicorn. <laughs> What is she right there? That's why you're saying all these nice things? Yeah, she gave me the, the look. Sorry to disturb your day. Everyone's mad at you, Willie. Better make this fast. I don't want the wrath of Luna. When I see you, I always think, I wonder what his quote would be. Give us six minutes and we'll ask as many questions as we can. Welcome to Cold Cuts. Cold Cuts. Cold Cuts. Hi, buddy Cal. Cooking with me. Dad's no babysit. It's called parenting. What was the first book you remember loving? Heart Smart Today, with simple exercises to strengthen your heart. Make the most of your beach days. It's all about the tracksuit oh, now. How wow. good do they look? I now pronounce you husband and wife. Kiss the bride. This morning, a story of people helping people. You've received tons of letters from people who have been inspired. Let's do the weather out. <laughs> OK. All you got to do is say, it's cold, it's warm, it's raining, it's snowing. That's it. One of our most favorite yes. franchises ever, oh. Ambush Makeovers. OK. <laughs> look at it. It doesn't, it doesn't look, look so good. No, it doesn't look good. <laughs> will you judge us in a cook-off? I yes. will. And okay. you guys will definitely win something. Today, all day. All day? All day. Welcome to Today, All Day.
Well, hello to everybody watching today all day. Happy Tuesday. Welcome to our digital show today in 30. And we have a really special show to bring mm. everybody today. We're shining a light on inspiring women on this International Women's Day. We threw a pretty special mm. event right on our plaza. Yeah, that was really cool. First, we met an amazing family. They just returned home with their newborn after a dramatic trip to Ukraine. Now, the mom speaking out and helping other babies who've been left behind. It is a remarkable story. You guys don't want to miss oh, that one. It's incredible. <laughs> we also meet Little League's first girl player. She made history 50 years ago. She's a trailblazer. She <laughs> talks about leveling the playing field by refusing to play by the rules. All that and the Navy commander making history at the helm of one of the world's oldest and most iconic ships. And from sea to space, we sat down with four remarkable women from NASA. They're on a mission to put the first woman and the first person of color on the moon. We got it all covered, it. don't we? It's coming up on this special Women's Day edition of Today, Today in 30. We are celebrating International Women's Day. An incredible story of hope is about to be revealed. I know. We are starting off yeah. the right way. We want to introduce you to Amy and Michael Kowalski. They had been counting down the moments until their daughter's birth by surrogate in Ukraine. Ahead of her arrival, they flew from Florida to Kiev. But just days later, war broke out and everything changed. We are so happy to say that Amy and Michael made it. They're back in the U.S. safely. They're here with 10-day-old baby Charlotte Marina. We're gonna meet them all in just a moment, but first, a peek at their remarkable journey. We literally pretty much took her from the womb to, uh, you know, war zones. Her miraculous arrival came under the most devastating circumstances. A surrogate carrying Michael and Amy Kowalski's baby went into labor in a Kiev hospital under fire. Just days earlier, Michael and Amy arrived in Ukraine from Florida to be there for her birth. Nobody locally was even really very concerned about it. But then, the first missile was launched. Ukraine was under attack. Michael and Amy jumped in a taxi to be with their surrogate. An 18-mile drive through Kiev took four hours. And all the roads were blocked. Some of them had been damaged. Two days later, on February 26, mom and dad got to meet their little girl. Charlotte Marina arrived weighing seven pounds, two ounces. Oh, here we go. Hey, here I am. Thank you seemed not nearly big enough, but they said goodbye to their surrogate as they were forced to flee. The family and their translator made it to a train station with not just Charlotte, but another new American baby whose parents were not able to get to Ukraine in time. The question, if we were going to go home, never crossed our minds. Of course we were. We just had to figure out, you know, a couple couple nights sleeping in train stations and on trains and detours. Traveling with two newborns, Michael and Amy were guided to safety by the kindness of strangers. At the train station, the community, like, poured out. They brought formula. They brought clothes. They brought blankets. Like, at every single point, somebody put their safety and well-being at risk to help us move safely. Michael and Amy safely crossed the border and delivered the other newborn in their care to their waiting American parents. And with an emergency passport in hand, baby Charlotte finally made her way home. <laughs> and you're home here, baby Charlotte Marina's here along with her mom and dad, Amy and Michael. What a journey. I mean, there are a million reasons that you're here, but if you had to pinpoint why this journey was made possible, how would you describe it? Uh, definitely, we would just say the blind kindness of others, faith in humanity and God's grace at every single turn. It just, uh, it, it's amazing the way everything worked out and the people who are still there, you know, doing the hard work on the ground, we wouldn't have been able to do it without them. On this journey, mm -hmm. you had that grace of God, mm -hmm. blessings and help of others just in the nick of time, yes. time and time again. Yes. I mean, I thought, it, I thought it was pretty incredible how you said you, a taxi driver drove you four hours. You gave him everything you had in your pockets. You had no money and you just went with two babies, no money. How did you feed and care for the children on, on, along the way? Again, blind, <laughs> blind faith there. Um, we, we did have, they let us go with the, some formula from the hospital. Uh -huh. Of course, we weren't expecting it to be such a long trip, yeah. so it was enough for one baby for a few days. We ended up having a couple babies for a little more days, mm -hmm. and we had some people, you know, the agency was awesome, and they made sure that at every turn when they could, they helped, you know, they helped, and then we had just 
random kindness of strangers just brought us formula, dry clothes. It's so incredible because yeah. not only did you have your new baby, yeah. you it, it decided to carry another newborn baby for an American couple that was just across the border who couldn't get there. Yeah. So you're t carrying two newborns with not a dollar in your pocket. Right? <laughs> I mean, I, I kind of can't even fathom it. And and um, how were the people there? I mean, how how what would you want Americans to know yeah. about what what you saw? I would just say that um, these guys are some of the bravest, mm -hmm. selfless people that I think I've ever met. In the thick of it, when they could have just very much been um, mm -hmm. letting us go, they they gave from themselves in spite of their own, the risk that they were taking for us. Well, and we, that Ukrainian Marina, by the way, yeah. whose little baby Charlotte, <laughs> Charlotte is named after, she sounds like yes. she was a yes. force yeah. of nature. Absolutely, her and then Tatiana, mm -hmm. who was, a, she came mm -hmm. across with us, which is really nice, and she's now um, somewhere else. But both of them, I mean, just being able to get, to yeah. let people know what, who we were and we had yeah. the babies, it was great. Well, Amy and Michael, we thought, we have a professional photographer, we call him yeah. Photo Nate. Photo Nate. Could, do you mind if he over? takes just a, yeah. a picture get of your a family? Beautiful. All right. So where Nate, are you, why don't you come on out? Oh, you know what? Okay. I think we might want to have a couple more people. Yeah, okay. Do a you family want to stand photo's up? Not... Let's get a family Can we photo. get in? Absolutely. You know Wait, these, why don't, you know why don't they get in? Oh, my God! <laughs> <laughs> these are oh your daughters. daughters. <laughs> oh, my God. This is insane. <laughs> this is the... Oh, your daughters are your uh, Your grown daughters. This is your new baby sister. <laughs> Here, let's get that picture, shall we? All right, photo date, you're on. <laughs> I can't even believe it. Are you looking right here for me? No. Michael, what does it mean to have your whole family together? A lot. <laughs> We have more though. Let's not remember. This yeah. isn't our whole family. Oh yeah, you have These many are girls. Some boys These are the home. girls. That's right. Well. These are yeah. women, our girls. Girls, what does it feel like seeing your baby sister for the first time? Okay. Amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. Oh, wow. What an incredible journey. What yeah. huge hearts you have. What courage you have. <laughs> Thank you. Charlotte Marina, you are ready for the world, my friend. You've got it all going on. All right, well, you guys want to hold her? Yeah. Oh, oh, we yeah. thought you were out of my head. <laughs> you go first, I'll go second. There you go. Oh, yeah. oh. Oh. While we're doing, we did want to, we did want to tell our grandson baby. happy birthday. So I'm assuming he's not here, but maybe on TV he'll be able to Charlotte see Marina. By the way. We are here to love you. She's perfect. She is. She's perfect. Oh, thank you. you guys, thank you for sharing your family with thank us. You. That was awesome. What a beautiful moment. Oh, and I just, <laughs> <laughs> see this little sweet face. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free. Now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free, now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Well, on this International Women's mm -hmm. Day, we are celebrating the greatness of influential and inspiring women from all walks of life. Mm -hmm. Among them, y'all are going to meet four women who are helping lead NASA's effort to put people back on the moon. We're going to talk to them in just a moment, but first, their journey with NASA's Artemis program. NASA's moon mission, named for the woman warrior Artemis, the Greek goddess, not only of the moon, but of the hunt. 
perfectly appropriate for NASA's program that will blaze a trail putting the first female and the first person of color on the lunar surface. It'll be the next giant leap for humankind. As you can see here today, there's some very talented women and this is very representative of what the entire Artemis program is about. Talented women like astronaut Stephanie Wilson, Space Launch System Associate Program Manager Sharon Cobb, Launch Director Charlie Blackwell Thompson, Orion Capsule Lead Engineer Laura Polaya. It's inspiring for, for me um, to, to see that, um, to know that there is, is no ceiling for us, that we can go wherever we put our, our minds to. Three, two, one, we have a liftoff, liftoff on Apollo 11. When Apollo 11 launched that mission that would put the first man on the moon in 1969, there was just one woman working in historic firing room one. Later this spring, when the rocket blasts off for the moon, 30% of the Artemis launch team will be women, led by Blackwell Thompson, NASA's first female launch director. That sends a message to young women that says not only is there a place in this firing room for you, there's a place in the front of the room for you leading this team. Stephanie Wilson, the second African-American woman to fly in space, is hoping she can be the first woman on the Artemis flight. And when the astronauts look back at our planet, the view will be much different than the one we see from here on Earth. The strife that might be happening on the world is not visible from space. So the borders of countries are not visible. To us, it appears as one unified world. All right, let's have, let's welcome these wonderful ladies to our stage. Sharon Cobb, who led that team that designed and built the powerful space launch system. Laura Palaya, who helped build the Orion capsule. Astronaut Stephanie Wilson, just the second ever black woman to fly in space. And Charlie Blackwell Thompson, who was the first woman to call the launch. Ladies! Oh my God, the hero walk. Okay, you these ladies have the right stuff. I mean, come on. We, wow, I just want to say, I, I'm just imagining as we're standing here that there are a lot of little girls who just watched that story oh. and said, wait a minute, if they can do it, I can do it. So why don't we start with Charlie. Charlie, tell us what you hope women take away from this. I'm sorry. Girl, look what young girls take away from watching you guys. Well, I hope young girls take away from watching us that, you know, girls can do anything. Anything is possible. So I hope that's the takeaway. There is no limits. There is nothing that is beyond your reach. For all of you, was this a yeah. lifelong dream or are you surprised to be standing here right now? Mm. No, it was a lifelong dream for me. I studied, uh, was very interested in science when I was a young person and so happy to study engineering and to be working at NASA now. Phenomenal. Who did you look at and say, if she can do it, I can do it? Well, my parents were very instrumental. Education was yeah. very important to them, and I had a lot of role models growing up. And uh, looking at the NASA workforce uh, and being able to uh, follow in the footsteps of others that had come before me, very mm -hmm. inspirational. And what's it been like? Because uh, you know, traditionally, this has yeah. been a male-dominated yeah. field, and here you guys are breaking mm -hmm. barriers. What's mm -hmm. that been like to go through that journey? There have always been strong women that have inspired me as I've mm -hmm. gone through my career, but it's just, it's wonderful to see how many more there are today than when I started at NASA. So there's there's just opportunities as long as you put your effort mm -hmm. into it. Mm -hmm. Do you ever think about the impact? I remember when I was young, you know, we dressed up as Mae Jemison, we learned about you know, all <laughs> yeah, these yeah. trailblazers, and now young uh -huh. girls will be, you know, dressing up like you yeah. and looking up to you. What does that feel like? Mm -hmm. It's wonderful to have the opportunity to represent them and to show them what's possible, as Charlie said, Nothing is, is outside of their limits or their reach. Wow. Well, thank you all. You're incredible. You really are. Sky's wait, Jim, Jim, wait, hold on. You got yeah. a little something to say. Well, I just, I would want to tack on to that there is no limit for girls. Girls who dream become women who, who inspire and have vision. And so dream big and go for the stars. Yeah. So much for coming. Go for we the stars you. and the moon. The right? sky is not <laughs> <laughs> She leads a team on the front lines of the world's biggest natural disasters and conflicts, including the war in Ukraine. And in fact, she just returned from Ukraine's border, even giving a first-hand account to the United Nations Security Council. Meet the Pennsylvania native leading a 20,000-person strong team across the globe. Kathy Russell is UNICEF's new executive director with a very important job to protect the world's children. 
Since taking the job last month, Kathy Russell has been on the road. She traveled to the Ukraine border supporting desperate refugees and their families as they crossed into safety in Romania. And to Afghanistan, meeting with Taliban officials, pushing them to commit to reopening schools for all girls this month. Hello. She also met with students at a UNICEF-sponsored school in Kandahar. And what would you be doing every day if you weren't here? And mothers at a hospital where their children are fighting starvation. Kathy Russell is no stranger to tough jobs. She's fought long and hard for women's rights, serving as ambassador at large for global women's issues for the State Department. And now she's ready to take on the fight for kids at a time when there are more conflicts and natural disasters than at any time in UNICEF's 75-year history. Kathy Russell will play a critical role in the future of all the world's children. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Allie Jackson now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Allie Jackson now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. We are back with more of our International Women's Day celebration. Okay, Jenna, you've been so excited about this. A remarkable story, a Navy commander paving the way for other women. You all just wait. For more than 220 years, the USS Constitution's crew was led by men. But now for the first time in naval history, a woman is at the helm. Commander Billy J. Farrell is stepping into history. A storied piece of American history, the USS Constitution is the Navy's oldest commissioned ship still at sea. First launched in 1797, this iconic warship is now navigating uncharted waters. Constitution story is still being written. By making history with the first ever woman commander. I had to pinch myself a few times to say, is this really happening? And how lucky I am to be the 77th commander of USS Constitution. Commander Billy Farrell was just a young girl when she saw a Naval Academy graduation on TV and knew this is what she had to do. As that sixth grade girl, did you think, okay, yeah, this is something I can do. You know, I'm a woman. I can go into the Navy. Even watching that ceremony, I saw that there were women in the class. It wasn't a matter of if I could do it. It was just a matter of when. Serving 18 years in the Navy, Commander Farrell has worked her way up to this 224-year-old deck. You were here, weren't you? Yeah, yeah. Where she's paving a way for others, including women serving under her command. It's very empowering as a woman to see that representation in a leadership position. Docked in Boston's Charlestown Navy Yard, the ship welcomes more than 350,000 visitors a year. I bet there's tourists, little girls who walk 
onto the ship and see you as the commander. I've definitely had some little girls come up and ask to give me a hug. It's very humbling. The Constitution is known as Old Ironsides because of the way cannonballs seem to bounce off her during the War of 1812. I'm just in awe of the story that she has and you know, the stories of our country and how it all ties together. Keeping that history alive, one of her cannons is still fired twice a day. Does it feel like a dream come true? Every day. Every day when I come here and step on this ship and just feel the history that is here, it really is an awe-inspiring experience to be here. Okay, and now let's welcome Commander Billy Farrell to the stage. Watching the TV, did you think like I am gonna break that glass ceiling? Oh, there's no way. There's no way I would have ever imagined that, you know, after 224 years, I would be the person that was afforded the opportunity to be the first woman commander of USS Constitution. Amazing. I want to know what it feels like when you put on this uniform. <laughs> yeah, oh, exactly. it's awesome. It's awesome, yeah. So I go to work normally in a 2022 uniform, yeah. and then I get to put this on though, and it's a wonderful, wonderful feeling to get to show the heritage of the Navy and where we started. It. Well, you talked about what it felt like when you, little girls came up to you and wanted to hug you, but give us a little bit more on what that felt like in your position. It's just unbelievable to, to you know, especially in the Navy, usually we're very in the background, and so yeah. to, to be recognized and to have those little girls come up and say, thank you for what you do, it's just so special. Well, a vessel with such history, and yeah. now yes. you are a part of that history. <laughs> Commander, thank you so much. Thank Can you we so just say much. on behalf of all of our daughters? Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you so much. Inspiration. Oh, all right. Wow. Well. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Welcome back. 50 years ago, Title IX was passed prohibiting gender discrimination in any federally funded education or athletic activity. Mm -hmm. That same year, 1972, a brave 11-year-old girl from Hoboken, New Jersey, was busy waging her own battle, one that would forever change the playing field of Little League Baseball. When somebody would ask me what I wanted to be when I grew up, I would always answer that I wanted to be a Yankee. As a girl growing up in Hoboken, New Jersey, Maria Pepe first started playing baseball to make new friends. We all had nicknames. It was Tippy and Louie and Juicy and Benji and Giga and I was Pepe. No one, I don't think, even knew my first name. <laughs> but soon her name would be one they'd remember. 
In the summer of 1972, 11-year-old Maria Pepe showed up to this very field to try out for the Little League team. The coach saw her in the dugout. He came over and he said, uh, are you going to sign up? And I looked at him and I'm like, well, you know, you know I'm a girl. Like, wow, can you play? And I'm like, yeah, I can play. Not only could she play, she was a star, making the team as starting pitcher. But Little League Baseball had banned girls from playing in 1951, and word got around Maria was on the team. After her third game, her coach showed up to her apartment. Yeah, I mean, I think it was hard when Jimmy came to our home and he wanted the uniform back. That was very hard. I got to keep my cap. Heartbroken, Maria's family, along with the National Organization for Women, took Little League Baseball to court for gender discrimination. More than two years later, they won in a landmark decision which would open Little League to all girls. But by then, at 14 years old, Maria was too old to play. So yes, there is a, a heartbreak at a young age, but I do get to, to play forever through all the girls that came after me. And so that's a blessing. That next season, 50 girls tried out for the Hoboken team. And since that time, it's estimated more than 5 million girls have played Little League Baseball. These girls, I tell you today, I'm so proud of them. That makes me happy. I could die tomorrow and know that I helped to open doors. That cap she got to keep now hangs in the Baseball Hall of Fame. And as for that pitching arm, uh, I can still throw the ball. <laughs> And here they are. We have Maria Pepe here along with 12 members of the New York Wonders. Let's give them a round of applause. Come on down. Thank you so much. Hey, baby. Thank you so much. We love you. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Amazing. Maria, you're here. Open the door. Right here. Come here, my friend. Come yeah. by me. <laughs> you have literally opened the door. Now here we are, 50 years later, for not only all of these girls behind us, but for millions of girls all over this country. Yeah. How does that feel? It feels amazing. I'm quite honored today. Uh, it's hard to not be emotional because I was so young um, when I was discriminated against because of my gender. And so I encourage the girls to believe in themselves and to never except anyone saying you can't do something just because you're a girl. Um, I'm quite honored. I get to play forever through all the girls <laughs> that came after me. That's the best gift that anybody could ask for. That's your legacy. Maria, it must have been hard to take on that fight yeah. as a little girl in 1972. It was hard yeah. only because it really wasn't about just baseball. It was about what girls should and shouldn't do in life. And so there was a a barrier that it was, seemed like, you know, it was very difficult to break through. I, I always believed I had the Lord on my side. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, so I, I feel very blessed Is that today. why you never, because some people in your situation might have quit. They might have said, you know what, the wall's too high. You know, I, I can't I, climb it. I could say I, I had a shield around me. Like, uh, <laughs> I just knew I needed to continue and carry this. <laughs> Um, I really love baseball, so I was not going to give up something that I love doing. Wow. We are so happy Maria. to give up a petite powerhouse. Thank you. Yes. Look at these great Thank girls behind you. the New York Wonders. All yes. right. Remember for these girls. Thank, well, you, thank you guys, guys too. It was a really inspiring oh, morning on our plaza. We're so happy we're able to share it with y'all. Happy Women's Day. We'll see you guys tomorrow.
There are a few things that make me happier than physically farming. Big, sweaty, kind of brutal tasks. I think I've always known in some form that this farm and this work around connecting people and land needed to exist. <laughs> you wanna be free of your anxiety. I'm so catchy. I think the wind likes it. <laughs> My name is Leah Penniman and I'm the founding co-director at Soul Fire Farm in Grafton, New York. Soul Fire Farm is a black indigenous led community farm that's dedicated to ending racism in the food system and training up the next generation of activist farmers. Between 1 and 2% of farms are black owned, which is down from a peak of 14% of black owned farms in 1910. And this is not because black folks don't want to farm. This is because of a whole legacy of discrimination of institutional racism. I grew up in a small rural town called Ashburnham, Massachusetts. I'm the oldest of three and we were, for most of our childhood, the only brown kids in our entire school and we experienced just a lot of social exclusion and racial bullying. It ranged from taunting, you know, being called names, to assumptions about our intelligence. The land and the forest were a salvation for me. I attended every single farming conference that I could afford to go to, but by my late teens, early 20s, I started to get disillusioned because I'd look around at these farming conferences and all the presenters were white and I looked around and there was only a handful of people of color. A mentor of mine said something so important to me at that time. You know, she was just like, look, don't give up. I know that right now it seems like you're out of place, but remember that our ancestors have been farmers for millennia and that our ancestors built the agricultural system of this country on their backs. I was really grateful that she was there and encouraged me to stick with it. My partner Jonah and I were living in the south end of Albany, New York with our then infant children, Nishima and Emmett, and despite our master's degrees and over a decade of farming experience, found it impossible to get fresh food for our children. There were no supermarkets, no farmer's markets, no available community garden plots. The only food is a corner store, a liquor store, and a McDonald's. This system of segregation uh, is termed by the government a food desert. To us, there's nothing natural about apartheid. Um, so we call it what it is, it's food apartheid. It comes out of a legacy of redlining and housing discrimination, of divestment from communities of color, and has resulted in the situation today where if you're white, you're four times as likely to have a supermarket on your block than if you're black. You're more likely to have diabetes, heart disease, and other diet-related illnesses. Not because you don't know how to eat, but because there you know, is a scarcity of affordable, culturally appropriate quality food um, that's accessible. And so we work to establish a community garden right on the corner plot near our home. So when our neighbors found out that we knew how to farm, they encouraged us to start the farm for the people. And the idea for Soul Fire Farm was born. We purchased the land in 2006 and it took us four years to transform this marginal, degraded and vacant land into human habitat and suitable farmland. And we opened the farm in 2011 with a small food distribution program that went right to our neighbors in the South End. A couple thousand folks roll through here every year to attend our farm training programs. The rest of you are just going to contemplate um, and pray for <laughs> the strawberries. Happy, happy um, homemaking. There are eight of us working here on the farm. We have an amazing team. We have a number of day-long programs and week-long camps for youth who are interested in farming and a whole lot of community days and workshops on particular skills. It's really whatever our community is asking us for, we do our best to provide. Our most popular is the week-long BIPOC FIRE, stands for Black Indigenous People of Color, Farming in Relationship with Earth. We have folks coming from 37 states and three countries this year, Spanish and English speakers, young and old. And we spend a week together uh, doing hands on the land training. Uh, we have a number of courses on business management, marketing, uh, as well as crop planning. If you count everyone who's gone through any program, we have over 10,000 alumni. We provide ongoing and forever mentorship. We hook folks up with jobs, uh, land, fellowships, and other opportunities. You know, land is the place where the lynchings, the beatings, the enslavement, the sharecropping took place. And so 
there's no way to escape the trauma associated with that. And so a big part of what I and we are trying to do at Soulfire is to reach back across the narrative of the hundreds of years of land-based oppression to Cleopatra's you know, compost piles and the raised beds of the Ovambo people in Namibia, to reach back to the work of Dr. George Washington Carver, creating regenerative agriculture, and Dr. Booker T. Watley with Farm to Table. So to really reclaim the dignity of it is super important. If we can't feed ourselves, we can't truly be free. All right, so everyone who's part of the tour, just come a little bit get started. We're gonna travel around the farm together, get a chance to visit some of the sacred sites, hear the stories, and you can ask your questions as well as we go. So follow me this way. Community Farm Day is our monthly public event where volunteers come from all around the region to share in the labor of the land, to have a potluck lunch, and then to participate in a tour and Q&A session. It's the one time that the farm's open to the public. Now what's very important with strawberries is that their meristem or growth point is right here. So what do you think happens if you bury that? Drowning. It will not grow. <laughs> <laughs> we have a bunch of different teams working on different tasks, um, including transplanting the fall strawberries, uh, cleaning and curing the garlic and onions, harvesting potatoes, removing some of the materials and supplies that we're done with for the season. And Jonah will be working with some volunteers, many of whom have traveled three or four hours just to get here today. We have a lot of teens that come through the farm and not all of them are gonna be farmers, but they see folks who look like them following their dreams and being their own bosses and running their own institutions. What matters to me is that they can see a wider vision of what's possible for their own lives. This is what we're trying to get yeah. to, so it's great to see it in person. Yeah, just a goal. It makes my heart flutter, <laughs> like honestly, I just like, I'm so inspired. you should please help all the teams clean up and put everything away. We do doorstep delivery of vegetables, eggs, pastured meat, and herbs, and folks can actually pay for that using their EBT benefits. The vast majority of people say that having those vegetables has made a huge difference in their health, whether that's a reduction in you know, blood pressure or cholesterol or overall sense of well-being. And especially for our lower income members, many of them say if it wasn't for those vegetables, they'd literally be eating ramen and boiled pasta and canned foods because they simply don't have anywhere to get, you know, fresh food like we offer. There's nothing that makes me happier than seeing our alumni farm. So for example, Dallas Robinson in North Carolina uh, just recently opened the Harriet Tubman farm. Folks like Keisha Cameron outside of Atlanta, Georgia at High Hog Farm. Fundamentally, I wanna create a different kind of educational environment for young people that I never got to experience where you know, you can go ahead and be proud to be a soil nerd and you also will have your culture uplifted, your heritage uplifted and be affirmed for who you are and and encouraged to pursue your wildest dreams. I see Leah and I like stand there and I listen to her and I'm just in complete awe. Like, like I feel a physical reaction in my body and I just want to like be quiet and listen. I've had mixed feelings in the past around doing public speaking. It always seemed like the real work was here on the farm and then I'd go out and just talk about the real work. And something shifted for me when I witnessed how many people who heard our talks then went on to join a program to learn how to farm, or did something like give away their land to a black farmer. It's really an honor and pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, I feel excited, I feel deeply pleased to talk about two of my favorite things, which are the earth and the ancestors and what they want us to be up to. Skull caps, you're gonna grow so strong. So we wrote this song. Our waiting list for our training programs is years long. Mm -hmm. Our people are yearning, right? Mm -hmm. Some of us confuse the scene of the crime, which was the land, with the crime. Mm -hmm. But the fact is the land has always had our back. In fact, we survived because of that connection with the land. My hope is that we spread our love, our knowledge, our resources out through the network of black and brown farmers so that 
you know, 10, 20 years from now, people will be like, wait, what's Soul Fire again? Because there's literally right around the corner a black and brown led teaching farm so that it becomes so commonplace that we have to remind our children about a time when all the land was white owned and a time when all the farmers were exploited because that's become such a distant memory. Do you think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Do you think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. Butchery is seen as this really large scale brute force thing and it takes a lot of physical strength, but a lot of it is also really intricate and small kind of meditative moments. Sausage making being one of those things. The color is still really nice. Yeah, it looks beautiful. I'm Cara Nicoletti, I'm a fourth generation butcher and co-founder of Seymour Meats and Veggies. <laughs> I want butchers in the future to not be scared of people eating less meat. I just think that we need to get a little bit more creative about our job. Everyone, the food is ready. The mission really is to make it easier and more fun for people to eat well. It turns out that adding vegetables, making that meat stretch farther, democratizes good meat, if you will, uh, makes it more available to more people. They're just so good. <laughs> my family's history in butchery started uh, with my great-great-grandfather. He was a cattle merchant in Russia. That was where my great-grandpa started working in the meat industry. And then he opened a shop in the north end of Boston in the 1940s with some of his family. When my grandpa was 13, him and his brother Bobby started working in the shop and eventually took it over. Is that you? That's me. Yeah. That's Bob. I'm Seymour Celeste, and I'm a retired butcher. Both of us went to work helping my dad in the meat market. My brother and I were partners until the day he passed away a couple of years ago. This was the store. Wow. 65 Salem Street. I had three daughters. I never thought that uh, my girls would be interested, and they weren't. My daughters used to bring the children into my office for me to take care of them while they went out and did things. And uh, Kara always wanted to go into the smelly room. I was, out of my sisters and my cousins, probably the most curious about what they were doing in the shop. Growing up, I always wanted to sort of like peek behind the curtain and see. I graduated in 2008, the economy collapsed. <laughs> I was working at a restaurant as a baker, and one of the owners who also had a grandfather who was a butcher was like, if you ever want to do some like light butchery work, breaking down chickens and pork shoulders and stuff, 
let me know. So I started doing that and it sort of like sparked an interest in me. So I started apprenticing for free. I did that for about a year and then left to go butcher full time. I remember calling my papa, Seymour, when I got my first apprenticeship. I could tell that he was hoping like it was something that didn't stick. Well, I said, you know, this is the, the funniest story, the funniest joke. You're, you're joking with me and everything else? And she said, no. I really have my entire working life worked with my hands and I enjoy that much more. I trusted her and believed in her. As a matter of fact, I gave her some of my tools. This is um, Papa Seymour's honing steel that he gave me. As soon as I started butchering full time, I gravitated toward sausage making immediately. And I realized pretty early on that I had like, hit on an idea. As much as I believe in regenerative agriculture and all of that, there's just no way to sustainably eat meat every single night of the week. So I started sneaking a lot of vegetables into my sausages. I had set out to make 40 pounds of sausages and after I'd mixed it all together, I weighed out the mix and it was like 70 something pounds. I had essentially doubled my meat <laughs> by adding vegetables to it. When I was working at Foster's and just like couldn't physically keep up with the demand was when I realized that it definitely was a scalable idea. It's been the last two years of working nonstop trying to get this to market. Uh, I went to close to 100 co-packers asking them if they would help me and every single one of them said no because what we're doing is more complicated. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start a conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Do you think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start a conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start a conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. We finally found one co-packer outside of uh, Kansas City, Missouri, the Phantasmas, and flew out to go see them, and they were like, sure, we'll try it. Hey! Hi! <laughs> How's it going? Good, how are you? Good. Oh, Mario! <laughs> Hi! I really owe everything to them because they saw something in me, and they saw something in my idea that they thought was worth taking a risk on. I was making Lou and Mario like <laughs> peel beets and dice them in the thing that makes bologna. I believe it was the challenge. Uh, we never done sausage with vegetables and meat combined at the amounts uh, that she was looking for. We immediately saw uh, the drive that she had, the passion she had about the sausages she made. We've always wanted to work with a sausage queen. <laughs> Oh! <gasps> 
Oh my gosh! Vivi, do you want to help me prep some vegetables? We went back and forth and back and forth about the name for a long time. We had a few different iterations that just didn't stick, and I always wanted it to be Seymour. These are cooking up fantastic, huh? <laughs> Look at those. They're just cooking up. Gorgeous. Gorgeous. I love her. And I said to her, no, 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 don't call it Seymour Meets Eventually, I wanted her to call it something like Kara's Kitchen because it really, you know, it's her. And of course, I am humbled by what she did. And uh, um, I'm very emotional about that. We are all obsessed with Seymour. We love him and use him as a model of, of positivity and gratitude. That delicious. So this is about honoring my whole family. The truth of the matter is, Kara revolutionized the uh, sausage business. Make no mistake, this was not an easy process, and I almost quit many, many, many times. Kara went to Whole Foods, and they bought her product immediately. I mean, I can lie awake at night thinking how remarkable it is that she was able to achieve that, and I'm very proud of her. Butchering is a really, really difficult job with very little financial payoff, but I would not do anything differently. Women make really good butchers and really good cooks, really good chefs. I think the more of us that are in this industry, the better. I understand what it takes to accomplish what she's accomplished. And let me tell you, it is no easy feat. And it didn't happen overnight for Kara. And it's just the beginning as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> I love you so much. Welcome to Today All Day. All day? Today All Day. All day. This is a long oh, way of asking, yeah, who's your okay. favorite character you've ever played? Oh, the right. unicorn. The unicorn. you got to have the unicorn. <laughs> what is she right there? That's why you're saying all these nice things? Yeah, she gave me the, the look. Sorry to disturb your day. Everyone's mad at you, Willie. Better make this fast. I don't want the wrath of Luna. When I see you, I always think, I wonder what his quote would be. Give us six minutes and we'll ask as many questions as we can. Welcome to Cold Cuts. Cold Cuts. Cold Cuts. Hi, buddy cow. Cooking with me. That's no babysit. It's called parenting. What was the first book you remember loving? Heart Smart Today. With simple exercises to strengthen your heart. Make the most of your beach days. It's all about the tracksuit now. How wow. good do they look? I now pronounce you husband and wife. Kiss the bride. NBC News, streaming free now. You think it's been healthy for the Democratic Party to highlight the division in the party? What does an exit ramp for Putin look like that allows him to save face? How much of this is on the CDC and how much of this is on Washington? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Prince. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Food, in a way, unlocks a lot of stories. It's this emotional connection that we get through eating that food that is really irreplaceable. 
My name is Chitra Agarwal. I'm a co-founder at Brooklyn Deli, where we make sauces and condiments inspired by my family's recipes from India. My name is Katevi, and I'm the chef and owner of Dumpling Club, a weekly subscription service that features a rotating menu of dumplings and Asian dishes. I started Brooklyn Deli in 2014. Our first products at Brooklyn Deli were my achars, which are a staple Indian condiment. They're kind of like this spicy, sour, a little bit sweet. So you add just a little bit and it kind of just makes the dish like amazing. I developed a lot of the recipes for achar using what I was getting in my farm share. So I was making achar from heirloom tomatoes, garlic, gooseberries. I wouldn't say that like, it's authentic Indian food. It's very much inspired by my heritage, but it's authentic to me. My grandfather comes from a region in northern China that, that specializes in dumplings. And to him, dumplings were the perfect food, the best food. I use all sorts of influences in the dumplings. For example, influences from my husband's Austrian side. That's not traditionally how dumplings would be made. I'm learning to be really comfortable with that. In the beginning, I felt like that wasn't truly authentic but I actually now feel that that's very authentic to me and my experience. A labor of love learned from generations before them. The pleating sort of represents on the outside the amount of care that's been put into this food. Whenever we made them as a family, seeing the pleats that my mom or that my grandfather added to the dumplings would remind me that they were the ones who prepared this food for me. My father's mother, we were just very close. I can still remember the food that she would give me. I can still taste it. They're kind of like food memories from when I was really young. And those continued on as I visited her every year in India. Every trip, we would be in the kitchen. Growing up, we didn't have regular access to Asian groceries, but I learned about the importance of food from my mom. She would use spaghetti whenever she was making stir-fried noodles. Her creativity, that creative spirit that she had when it came to replicating her home food through whatever ingredients that she had on hand, that's what I feel really inspired by. Both women left stable jobs for their culinary careers. It was a really scary time because, I mean, I had been working for over a decade in positions where I had benefits, I had an ongoing salary that I could count on. I left Google in the fall of 2019, and already that year I was starting to make dumplings, send them around to friends and family, and when I decided to really start in earnest was in February 2020, conveniently one month before the pandemic hit and everything shut down. I didn't have a steady job or an income at that time and whenever I had a spare moment, I'd fold dumplings and then I would stay up all hours editing footage and putting it up on Instagram and we were just trying to survive. Despite the pandemic, their businesses not only survived, but thrived. Our public sales tend to sell out within a few minutes. One time it sold out in less than a minute. For us, it's been great because more people want to try the flavors that we're putting out there and want to learn more about Indian food and culture. Everything that I really learned how to make, I learned from different family members. So I feel like in some sense, the Brooklyn Deli recipes also are a way for our family recipes to kind of live on. When my parents came to the States, they really came here with nothing. And I'm super cognizant of that now, that it's a huge privilege to be able to, to do what I love, to go after what I love. And that has come from years of sacrifice and hard work from my parents. And knowing that, I want to take that privilege and make sure that I do something really positive with it.
breaking overnight, not afraid. Ukraine's President Zelensky sending a defiant message to Vladimir Putin from his own office in Kyiv, doubling down on his pledge to lead his nation's resistance against the Russian invasion. But this morning, the humanitarian crisis worsening with the number of refugees now set to reach 2 million.